Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's won the world championship at every belt level. He's also a five time black belt world Jiu Jitsu champion and a four time ADCC champion. He was a three time Brazilian national champion and also a Pan Ams champion. He's been, he's been inducted into the IBJJF Hall of Fame and he's considered by many to be the greatest Jiu Jitsu competitor of all time. He has his very own world renowned academy in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be joined today for the third time in my podcasting career by Professor Marcelo Garcia. How are you today, Marcelo? Oh, I've been doing great. We always have a great conversation. Can't wait to do it again. Oh, uh, me too, Marcelo. Yeah, we were just talking off here. The last time you and I talked, we were both stuck in our apartments during COVID. And uh, so we figured, hey, this is probably a good time to do a podcast since we can't go anywhere. We can't train. We can't do anything. Uh, catch us up with that. I, I know you've had a lot going on since then. Uh, catch us up. I know you've moved and you also have gone through some health uh, a health scare. So can, can you tell us about what you've been up to in the last few years? Um obviously everybody know that 2020 with the pandemic was was sucks you know what i mean everybody have like a hard time i was having my hard time too and then my gym was closed i couldn't do anything in new york so we decided to move to hawaii in the meantime we always wish to see how it is to live in hawaii you always have a great time over here obviously like everybody will probably have the same but since my gym was closed we just decided to spend the whole year here the kids was able to go to school the numbers of covid was so low over here and then after a year, the, my gym starts to open again. And then realize like, okay, we got to go back. We got to get our life back together again. You know what I mean? Organize everything. And then we went back. But then it was hard because the kids went from the outside to the inside of the apartment. And then they couldn't adapt. And a year being in New York, we realized like a special. My son was not doing well in school, was having like some hard time. We realized like, okay, we got to go back. And then we came back. Everything was fine. I was planning to open the gym over here because I want to have a second location. Um, I cannot stay here and not doing jiu-jitsu. I feel like I need my routine. And then obviously, like, uh, uh, my stomach can't appear and then I have to deal with that. I was lucky that I found that early. But then I have to go through a big surgery, uh, eight chemotherapy, like, treatment. Uh, I went over all this. It was not easy. It was not fun. It was just, like, sucks so much. But I was able to go over this and now I've been like uh, over six months, like a cancer free. So I can't complain. Life is good, right? Uh, just a good vibes right now. You know? That's so incredible. Yeah, Marcelo, the whole jiu-jitsu community was really was really uh, shocked to hear that, about your cancer diagnosis. And I'm so thankful they found it early and I'm so thankful you were able to get the proper treatment. And obviously being cancer free for six months is a big deal. So huge congratulations. We're all collectively very, very happy to hear that. Such great news. Um, now, obviously moving to Hawaii, I, you never miss the snow or the traffic or anything like that. Is it, has it been difficult living in Hawaii? <laughs> uh, obviously I cannot say that, right? But obviously I miss I miss I miss like uh, uh, my gym. I miss like uh, obviously like many close friends. I miss my jujitsu. Uh, I miss literally the city that I've been there for so long. But I'm the type of guy that like I'm happy where my kids are happy now. So I realize they're more happy over here. So I'm happy over here. But obviously I miss all that. But I'm I'm still to the point that my kids they're still little. So I feel like I'm all I can do for them. Like I'll do it. So. As long as they're happy, I'm happy. And obviously, I can't complain to being Hawaii you now. Now, I know that you had to take a year off of uh, teaching and training and everything be during the pandemic. And then I know that you also took another year, correct me if I'm wrong, to fight your cancer. You had to, you had to take a, a year away from training and teaching. I, I can't imagine how tough that must have been for someone like you, who jujitsu is everything that you do. It's, it's, it's your ethos. All right. Obviously, it was a lot. You know, it was a lot, but... One more time, I was I was not count the days. Any 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 time we have a problem, you cannot count the days. You cannot count the hours. You know what I mean? So I'm, I was just let it go. I was just kind of like I, I accept what I was going through. But at the same time, I was always think about like, okay, it's just like a, a another problem. It's just like a, maybe a bigger problem. And I know like a problem comes and goes. So I was just waiting to to pass through that. You know. Marcel, a lot of people that survive cancer say the experience gives them a new perspective about things. And you, you always seem to be a, a very happy and optimistic person. You seem like you genuinely really enjoy life. But with that said, has, has this experience renewed your perspective on life in any way? We hear that a lot, you know what I mean? And I went through another tough problem, another tough problems, you know what I mean? Uh, another like a tough situation, you know what I mean? And I was always so grateful. I was always like, a, I'm, I'm always that person when I wake up, I was like, oh, thank you for 
to me be able to wake up. Thank you. I thank God for everything. I'm constantly like I just kind of remind myself. It's almost like exercise that I do that I have to try like I appreciate everything we have. I appreciate like a every every day. I'm always I almost feel like I do that too much. So when the cancer thing and I was able to recover and survive and I'm feeling great. I feel like uh, I almost I have to relax. I don't want to like just kind of I don't want to leave my day like it's the last day. I, it's almost like the opposite. I want to try just like enjoy now and don't just don't think about like this is my last day. So I got to appreciate that. Like, you know how people say like, uh, oh, you got to live your, your life like it's the last day. Yeah, but this can be very stressful. I don't want to live my life like it's the last day. I want to just kind of I just want to be here. I just want to enjoy like whatever my day is giving to me. If it's an easy day, if it's a tougher day, I just want to enjoy that because I felt like I did that too much before. So I got to a point that was too much and I just like, uh, oh, I don't want to think about like uh, uh, that way anymore. I just want to like, uh, it's to enjoy, I appreciate everything. Uh, I try, I try like uh, um, leave the little things. I don't want to just let little piece, let, let little things kind of pass through. I, I I still appreciate that, but I almost feel like I want to just relax more and just enjoy more. You know, that was part of my life. I always try playing too far ahead. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm just now I'm just relaxing. You know? Obviously, you've you've come back to train now after after being out for a year. How how did you feel coming back? How's 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 it been uh, getting back into the swing of regularly training again? Oh uh, right, it was like a crazy because my doctors doctors because obviously like it was not just one doctor. They didn't give much expectation. What should I do? What I'll be able to do? What not? It was a very little expectation. And I didn't know if I was able to go back train. So on my mind, being this whole year going through the stuff, I was very concerned if I was able to do jiu-jitsu again. And uh, for now, it feels like uh, uh, I just been out of train for a year. I didn't feel like I went through a big surge. My body is adapted. I just felt like I'm just feel like a, I'm... I'm just out of shape, getting back in shape. You know? Obviously, it's part of the whole treatment. This is like a what probably like a uh, that's the problem that probably I went through. But on my mind, just feel like okay, I'm just feeling out of shape, and and obviously like I'm I'm adapting a lot of stuff in uh, beside training. You know, what I mean, with my my food, all this stuff. Like I have to adapt a lot of stuff like that. But in training, I'm just feel out of shape. You know, what I mean. And not that out of shape. I'm just, I'm enjoying this again a lot. I'm having a great time, but I just feel like a, a year without training. So I can't complain. It's, it's been great to be able to do jujitsu basic, basic how I was doing before, because I was very concerned if I was like, a, oh, maybe I'm going to be able to do jujitsu, but not exact how I used to do before. Basic, like I still can train hard. And my fear was like, oh, if I cannot train hard, you know what I mean? Maybe I cannot train hard every day. Maybe I cannot train hard twice a day, like I, I used to do when I was like 20 years old. But like, just to be able to some days, like, okay, today I want to train hard. And then be able to do that, I feel great, you know? Awesome. You know, I, I remember during the COVID lockdowns and restrictions, I, I had to stay out for almost a year myself. I, I had a family member that was going through a health issue at the time and the treatment she was receiving like significantly weakened her immune system. So, mm -hmm. so she was really vulnerable. So the risk of me training jujitsu and potentially passing something to her at the time was really serious. And I remember having similar thoughts like, man, I, 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 I'm probably going to lose so much of my progress that I've built from being out this long. I was really depressed about it. Uh, but there was actually something that John Danaher said on Instagram that really helped me at the time, he, he explained that the skills in jiu-jitsu that we build are very difficult to build, and it takes a lot of time and repetition to acquire those skills in the first place. So because of that, it's not it, it's not easy to lose them. Like they don't, they, your skills don't really deteriorate. It's more like your cardio and your timing and things like that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you agree with that idea, or do you, or do you feel uh, skills? Make, yeah. make total sense, you know, make total sense. Like uh, I, be, I have been training so hard for a long time, and it was funny because you know, as you get old, like you get a little bit more busy with life and stuff. And then many times I always end up losing like a week of train for some reason, you know, many different reasons. Traveling, something happened and then I end up, and in that time that I was training so hard when I lost, when I missed that whole week, I was able to just train better after, you know what I mean? So that's the, the type of thing. Sometimes the, the, the time off even makes you feel better. But when I say makes you feel better, just kind of like a, heel copper stuff so based on those little moments i felt like even if i stay longer 
I don't think I was going to forget. But then at the same time, like I was just kind of missing so much. That's, that's what was bothering me. I was just missing that. I was not worried. I was just missing so much. You know, and that's kind of like a, what's, what's happened with me. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. You know, there's, there's obviously going to be lots of people listening to the show right now that, that are going to go through layoffs in jujitsu, things like injuries, family stuff, careers. Uh, what advice would you give to someone that's coming back from a really long period off? Like what, what are some reasonable expectations that they should have coming back to training after being out for a while? Uh, right. We have, we have to deal with one problem at a time. There's so many stuff is going on. So, so if you have to do for one thing, like just deal with that and just don't worry about the other stuff because that's priorities, you know? And I feel like that's what you got to do. If you're dealing with coming back, don't make another problem. Don't create another problem. Just don't try to put one problem in front of the other problem because maybe it would be too hard for us to, to fix that, you know? And that was, that was my goal. When I was coming back and train, I was dealing with recover. I was dealing with like a, a, not so sure what was going to happen. So my concern was just be able to go back train and don't hurt anything else. Because we know, we know like uh, beside my cancer, we know be a year without train, I can easily come back and tour something or rip something or just, uh, uh, you know, hyper extend like uh, something. So I'll, I just don't want to have any other injury. So I was able to go back and just kind of like uh, come back slow and don't rush, don't push too hard. And obviously I'll still try to have fun, train a little hard, but I was, my most concern is still is like, I just don't want to hurt anything else. I don't want to be like a two weeks off for, for another reason. So just kind of just do one thing at a time and don't, and don't worry. Like, uh, um, don't, don't let your ego kind of pushes you in a, in a, in a wrong direction because that's kind of what usually is the problem. When you stay two weeks off, when you stay three months off, six months off from like an ACL surgery, and then we come back and you got to keep your, your, your ego like uh, under your control because you can literally like uh, end up getting like uh, all the problems that you shouldn't be dealing when you still recover from the other problem, you know? Yeah, that, that's excellent advice. I, I think that's something a lot of jujitsu people would would suffer from too. Is that you have a lot of personalities in jujitsu that are very hyper competitive people, and and demand a lot of themselves and set standards for themselves in their training and in their and in their competition. So when they come back after a long time, I think people naturally want to think they're going to pick right back up from where they left off, and that can cause injuries and you know re-triggering whatever you know whatever put you out if you were out for injuries that could that could you know, extend that for you even longer, which is difficult. So that's excellent advice. In general, Marcelo, how do you, how do you encourage students to structure a training schedule that allows them to train consistently, but avoiding things like burnout and injury? Do you think that obviously there's, there's the, the mindset like everyday pojada where you just go every day and train really hard. And some people have a, have a way that they kind of have a couple hard days a week balanced out with more technical training days. What do you think in your experience as a teacher for so long has been the most efficient for your students? Uh, obviously my mind has like a, a that and change a lot, you know, as, as it got old, once it got old, like, uh, not just like the bad side of get old, but uh, the, I, I felt like I learned more. I, I, I feel like, uh, I have a better understand what happened to my career all these years. And one more time I have to bring it up, like a, a way to train. I feel like you need to just control your ego and you can go hard. You can go like a, a pohada every day. But at the same time, like, uh, you need to be smart, you know, um, if you want to be prepared to a tournament, if you want to, if you want to like uh, go there in the day, be able to display your best, you need to feel like, uh, you the most health possible, the, the least injured, injured possible. So you cannot go to the day of the tournament, the day that is more important for you, the day that you should be performing, the day that you don't want to lose an inch. You don't want to lose to anything for anybody. You don't want to give like a, anything. And then that day you feel like miserable because you're so like, a, a, um, injured. You still recover for uh, all the injury. So I feel like, I, I always enjoy training hard and, and right. I never choose my train. I, I, I have trained with the biggest, the smaller, the toughest on front of anybody. You know, it's not that like, Oh, today's a day's camera. I don't want to train with that guy because maybe you're going to no, I have never choose that. I have always like, a. Uh, done the opposite too. I have choose the toughest train because I know that people uh, film. I know I know that I want to I want to I want to show what people wants to see. You know what I mean? Me like training with somebody hard, and that obviously like that. 
I have paid the price for that too. But I realized at the same time, like you have to be smart. You cannot hurt yourself. Like uh, what I'm trying to say, like uh, um, in training, that especially in training, there's a position that I know I can get hurt. Like uh, I tap, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm avoid get hurt because I want to do it again. I want to, I want to kind of like uh, uh, understand and, and, and recover from that. Okay, I did a mistake. I got cut in something. I tap because I want to go again, try avoid that mistake again. So I feel like for anyone that is trained and sometimes feel a little bit hard to hard to like uh, uh, improve from from the place that they are right now. You need to figure it out. You need to figure it out. Like uh, it's not because you're stuck in a position. And you feel like oh, if I try and move over here, I'm gonna tap. Yeah, but you have to figure it out. Maybe if you move over here, you're not going to tap. Maybe you think you're going to tap. Maybe you're going to figure out like a, uh, how much resistance you have. Or maybe you're going to figure out one way that you tap. And next time you're going to figure out like, okay, that way I tap. So this time I'm going to make another way. This time I'm going to choose another way out because that one I already tapped. And maybe you already tapped 10 times in that same position, getting out in a different ways. But you figure it out. That's kind of like part of learning jiu-jitsu. You need to figure it out. When I say figure it out, like I have to find out if this position will, will make me tap or if this position will be something that I'll, I can solve the problem. And that's that's like the biggest advice that I, I'll give to people right now. Just kind of leave your ego outside and when you're going to go train, I don't want you to tap, but I want you to figure it out if that move will make you tap or not. Like if even if it's like a, a 20 seconds left and you have an arm stuck like Oh, it's your chance to try get out. You already know you can hold. Okay, I can hold that 10 seconds. I can hold like a 20 seconds. But then I was like, okay, let me try get out. And you try get out, you tap. And you realize, okay, next time, I know if I try get out 10 seconds left, I shouldn't do that, you know what I mean? So next time I would like, uh, I can hold. Or maybe next time you're like, okay, now I know I can get out. I was able to escape. So if one day I really need to risk like a, a submission to try get out because I'm already losing. And I need to get back on top. So, so you, you, you have find out. You know? it, it's, it's a, I think, a common mental trap that people fall into. And it's an ego trap where you want to play your A game all the time so that you don't feel the sting of getting submitted. But what you're saying here is so valuable. Like you really do have to leave your comfort zone in order to develop these key areas of jujitsu. So I think it's, it's, it's really outstanding that you pointed that out. Um, let me ask you this, Marcelo. You're someone that's always um, always referred to as someone having a very healthy ego. You're, you, you train with everybody. You're always smiling. You're always happy. And was there ever a time in your in your progression in jujitsu where, where your ego hurt you? Did, did you ever have, can you remember a time where, it's, where maybe you weren't in the best control of your ego and it caused you either an injury or a problem of some kind? Um, I feel like I'm fighting my ego every day, every moment. I'm, I have to balance that out. Basic, what, what I'm trying to say, like, I, I, um, I don't want to make it easy for my opponents or for my training partner. I never want to make it easy for them. That's kind of like my ego, like, oh, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, give them something. I don't want to. But at the same time, I'm I'm ha I have to keep learning. I have to keep like a, a progress on, on my game. But right, I I don't I don't feel I don't feel that way because I was able to always balance. What I'm saying, balance like a, balance my train and balance my my competing moment. Like in train, I go the hardest I can. But if I know if I notice like a, okay, I can get hurt right now. So I, I'm just kind of like back away. I back away because I cannot get hurt in, in train. Uh, in the tournament, I have let myself kind of like a, uh, risk a little bit more. But at the same time, you know what I mean? I will not going to hold like a, a arm bar, let somebody break my arm. And then I'm not going to be able to compete next weekend again because I was that I was that kind of guy that I have compete. I have compete the most six weekends in the row. So I, I need to compete. I feel I need to learn. I need to train more. So I, I never felt like that the ego was something that hurt more. If it happens, like I probably have fixed them, you know. So that's why I don't have that much in my memory. But I'm I'm constantly like fighting my ego to make me improve, but at the same time don't 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 hurt my learn process. Marcelo, what do you think was the toughest rank that you had? What was the hardest period of jujitsu for you? I'll say purple and brown. Yeah. Basic, like those two moments there, one in purple and one in brown, that I was like, I, I don't think I'm learning jiu-jitsu. I don't think I'm getting better. 
but at the same time, I was just so new. When I say so new, like uh, you think five years it is a lot, especially when you're like uh, uh, 16, 17, you think it's a lot. But at the same time, it was just the beginning. But those moments, like I felt like I wasn't learning. But at the same time, I was like, okay, even I'm not learning more, even I'm not improving like I was improved from blue to purple, maybe white to blue. Maybe I'm not improved as fast as I was. And then I thought, I, I just checked myself. I was like, yeah, but I'm still enjoy training. I still like have fun. So uh, I'm, I'm happy doing this than anything else. So I was like, okay, let me just keep going. So that happened first when I was a pole belt. And then later that happened as a brown belt. And then I have to condition myself that like, uh, I've been here before. I've been in this moment before. I have to believe this is just part of the process. This happened before, so I just need to keep training. Obviously, it was hard to believe something that like I wasn't sure because that just happened once and then I was able to recover. I was able to get better from purple to brown. But then from brown to black, that happened again. I was like... A, uh, I don't think I'm getting better, but then I was like, okay, I'm just trust that I'm still doing something that I love to do. And I know it's just part of the process to give more time. And, and then since then, I never have that tough moment uh, about the learn process because I just, I just believe that time, time is just like a, a part of the training. Just give the time and keep like a, keep working hard, keep like a, a consistent and just give it time. You know? That's great. You know, Marcelo, what you just said there probably resonates with a lot of people listening. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the feeling of being stuck in place and that even though you're training, you're not learning and you're not improving. I think a lot of people go through that. Well, what advice would you offer to people that feel like they're progressing really slowly in jujitsu, maybe moving through the ranks slower than their peers? Well, what would you say to someone that feels like they're in that position right now? A part of this is because sometimes we get stuck in one thing, one thing only, one move. Mm. Uh, I grew up in jiu-jitsu with so many people around me that they're only good in one move, or maybe two, but really far apart. They have one sweep and one guard pass. And obviously, like, in between that, one submission. So one move. In each position, guard pass, sweep, they only have one move. Okay, I understand. That's, that's a lot. It took a lot to learn that. I know, especially when you feel like you master. When you say master, like, oh, this is my favorite move. I can do this over and over. Yeah, but that's too little. I know it was hard, but this is too little. We can learn a lot more. Our body can do a lot more. And that was part of what makes it easy for me because I was always trying to learn something new. So many times when I was stuck in something, when I felt like I wasn't learning was learn as fast as I was before, I realized like, okay, let me get over this stop doing what I was doing and then I was not learning as fast. Let me just, let me just go back like to the white belt. I felt like, okay, I need to learn another move. I need to get another move and start learning. So that makes me feel like I was learning something new. So the same progress, that problem I was having from white to blue, I was having again, but with another move. And then later on, everything starts to connect. When I say start to connect, like I was able to choose the moves that they're combined with each other. They they make a sequence. They make they make a combo. Like you do this move, the person defend. You do another move, the other person defend. But then you have this other move that you learn lately that was able to connect this one. And then maybe this one works. So that was like one of my recommendations. Like just like don't be stuck in one position. As soon that you master something, move on because uh, that will make so much more fun. That will make jujitsu so much more like jujitsu. The, the passion that you have to learn the first move when you white to blue belt later on when you try to learn another move even if you brown black belt you're still gonna have the same passion because you learn something new but then obviously like one more time we have to talk about like the ego thing that you have to just kind of let it go you know what's something that you think uh, you learned more as a black belt than you did at any other rank what, what, what's something that you learned or at least didn't fully understand until you were a black belt oh uh, that's hard <laughs> That's hard because like uh, I was always like a very free, open mind to just learn everything. Um, let's say, let's say like a, a no gi. Maybe that was something that I learned after after late. When I say late, like uh, I was brown to black. That's when I was really learned no gi. I have tried before. It was kind of like disappoint, and I felt like I don't want to do it because. I was not doing well, 
But then like uh, from brown to black, that's when I was forced to train no gi from my coach, Fab Gurgel. What was the best thing that he could have done for me? And I was lucky to be able to to listen to him and 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 trust on what he what he has planned me to do in those train in those days. So probably was no gi. No gi. That was something that I saw like, oh, I don't think I was I'm made for no gi. I don't think my body is good for no gi. I don't think no gi is so much fun like gi. I was always looking for excuse to don't do no gi. And that was something that I learned later, like, uh, doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Like, uh, doesn't matter if you're good in something, you always can learn something new. Doesn't matter if you have, like, uh, not a good experience before, but then if you try lately, maybe you have. So that's maybe, like, the biggest thing that I learned later, lately, you know. That's excellent. Let me ask another question. That's kind of in the, kind of the same question, but a little different. What What do you think is the difference between the way a black belt applies jujitsu compared to how, say, a purple belt applies jujitsu? What are some things that, let's say, that two a black belt and a purple belt are doing the same techniques? What are some things that the black belt is doing that you maybe can't see that the purple belt's not doing? Um, we we can talk a lot about this stuff. More more I think, more I'm gonna be able to just kind of like come out of a, with with ways to to answer that. But the first thing that come in mind, like a, obviously the black belt has more experience. The ten years black belt obviously has more experience. And based on how how long I've been coaching my students, not just on me, I I base I base on myself, but obviously I base on other people's experience too. I don't want to just learn from my experience. I want to learn from other people's experience and mistakes. Uh, the difference is like uh, there is a move that was known before the Poho belt. There was a move that like that black belt learned when he was a blue belt and the other Poho belt have not even learned how to train. So even those moves the black belt doesn't do anymore, they already know that. So they never get surprised. They never get kind of like a cut by surprise with those moves. And that's like some very simple moves. So basic, the, the experience that the higher belt has or the, the experience that the longer black belt has is because he has see a different generation of position, a different moves that people say, oh, this is like the new move everybody's learning, and then he's doing that. But then the purple belt that started lately, that he just learned the new moves. He didn't learn the old moves. I remember like a coach, one of my students, and then he, there's a very like a simple sweep that from the close guard that you just reach the ankle and make the, and make the person fall on his butt. And then when they got to try to come back, they get cut in the armbar. That was a really cool move when people doing that back in the days. But today is like a, people doesn't do that anymore. But at the same time, if somebody do it to you, you better be ready because you can get cut on that. So I have my students like who was so good and then he didn't notice that coming in. He got cut in the move. I was like, Oh, that's such like an easy move. That's just like an old move. You should know that. But he's like, but he didn't know. He fell. He fell on his butt. And then when he tried to come back, he just got cut in the armbar. So I feel like that's kind of like part of the exam. There's a lot of moves that the Poho belt doesn't know. And and literally, there's a lot of different phase that care those moves like in Jiu-Jitsu. So, so we got to just keep doing so we can keep like a sharp, like all those moves together, you know. You talked earlier about uh, how exploring no gi was it was a significant part of your journey in jujitsu, and it happened more as a black belt. And this, I have a, this is an interesting question to ask you because you excelled both in gi and no gi competition. It, it seems that in the competitive scene right now, no gi jujitsu is as popular as ever. Like we have ADCC reaching new heights all the time. Events like Who's Number One and the UFC Invitational and Polaris uh, are drawing lots of attention. Do you think that the future of the sport is going to be mostly no gi? Uh, could be right. It's hard to just know the future, but it could be. But I, I gotta say something, and I have to defend a, a very strong belief of mine. I have to defend because I already know a lot of people are already against that. Uh, I like to trust that gi helps no gi, and no gi ha- helps gi. I like to trust that because that's kind of not my philosophy, but that's something that I I have proved for myself for myself that that's what that's what makes my jiu-jitsu better my jiu-jitsu what i'm when i say my jiu-jitsu like uh um, my style like uh when i when i do no gi right um i try hold my st- my i try hold my my opponent so hard like if i have a gi 
when I'm doing no gi, I, I, I'm able to find a position that I'm, I'm grabbing. Obviously, there's no gi there. But when I make the grips, when I, when I find the angles, I feel like I have a gi. And then the other way around, when I'm doing gi, and we, me and my opponents, like our, our forearms is already like a so fatigued and tired. There's no more like hold because you're already like a gas out your muscle. You're, you being in a bad position, you hold one position a little longer and you fatigue like that part of your body. So now there's no more hold. There's no more strong grip. But then you keep a strong pace. They can slide out of position. You can kind of like a dive into a, a position. And I feel that's kind of like a no gi. That's kind of like first thing that I like to say. You can tr you can hold really hard your opponent in no gi like if you have a gi, and you can knee cut in the gi like if you have no gi, no grip, no pants, anything. I believe on that. And the the all the ways like uh, people doesn't understand, and it's part of my obligation to try to teach people because. That's what I love to do. I like to do jiu-jitsu, and I like to try to teach the jiu-jitsu that I know. Um, there's a two parts. There's a two parts in the no-gi game. And when I say no-gi game, like in the no-gi fight, the no-gi round, in no-gi match. There's like the first four minutes when you begin a no-gi match, and the last four minutes. Based the first five minutes, the last five minutes. Depends how long is, is your is your round, right? When we start no gi and we both dry, the air condition is, is cold, like nobody's break sweat, or you already broke sweat, but then they make you stay standing up like uh, waiting to go compete and those 10 minutes waiting for the next match to finish, you're already dry again. So that is one way to do ju no gi jiu-jitsu when you begin. And there's another way to do no gi jiu jitsu when you finish a round. And it's completely different. And I take advantage of both. When I begin the no gi match, when I begin the no gi match, I go the hardest I can because I, I have the best grip possible. And I'm taking advantage of that grip. That grip, like a basic, if I hold a submission, I'll try it on let go because it's dry. It's grippy, and I believe that submission will be more effective because it's not slipping out. And my arms, my, my body is fresh. I'm able to hold that position as long as I can. But then, after five minutes, that we are both break sweat, that you know where in rash guard and you drip sweating. Okay, now I'm not doing those five minutes anymore. Now my, my game is changed. Now my no gi technique is different. I'm not holding you anymore. I'm going to take advantage of your sweaty. I'm going to take advantage of me sweaty too. And I'm going to slide to the position. And then I'm going to try to establish. Basically, I'm going to jump in a sweaty like position, slip out, and try to land and try to hold as much as I can. And then if that's not enough, I'm going to make you so tired on that pace, that very sweaty and quick and sliding, that I hope like you're not used to that either. Because you're already tired from the first five minutes that I was that was hold and squeeze you down and try to go hard in the beginning. So that's kind of like a part of what I try to teach my students that we have to take advantage of the mat, like from the beginning to the ending. That's outstanding. So, so, so the first, so for the first four minutes, you're looking to get the kill. You're looking to get the submission while your grips are strong, while everything's dry. Once it gets slippery, about halfway through and beyond, it's more about scrambling and obtaining control, and less about trying to actually finish the match with submission. Did, did, I, did I understand that correctly? Basic, basic. Yeah. But I'm not just going to the submission. The first begin in the first begin of the mat, Ryan. I'm not moving back an inch. Mm. I'm not giving you like a, a, a inch to breathe. I'm, I'm on top of you. I'm holding you. I'm grabbing you. And I'm just trying to hold you like the hardest I can and don't let you, don't let you out of the control. I want to control you. And then in between that, if I see a submission, I'll try to hit a submission hard before we both start slippery. And if you are used to sleep out of the position, I promise you in the first two minutes, you're going to have to break out of the submission, not slip out of the submission. Like many people there, oh, it's so hard to, to submit. Yeah, you're so hard to submit because you like get so sweaty and then the person is so used to scrambling and slip out of the position. When you have a tight su submission in the first 30 seconds, because I'll try, 
Right. I, I, I can't promise I'm going to submit, submit my opponents the first two minutes, but I will try really hard. And the grip that I make in the first two minutes is totally different in the, in the grip that I make in the last two minutes because we're both very sweaty. Like maybe it was a 15 minutes mat, maybe it was a 20 minutes mat. Like who knows what are the rules today? You know? That's great. So when we get into the more sweaty, slippery side of the round, what things do you rely on most? Are there particular positions or transitions or things that you look for that are most reliable when you can't have those real reliable grips? Uh, I'm going to be very, I still going, I still can be very precise. We're talking about scrim, but I'm still going to be very precise, but not much control. Mm. Basically, I'm going to land in something very slippery and I'm going to try, just try to stay there. Even I know like the ground is slippery. Uh, your opponent is slippery. You try to hold him, you're slippery too. So basically I'm gonna push the pace, but not try hold the position. I'm gonna push the pace. I lost the position, it's slipper. We both slip out of the position, but I'm gonna keep pushing again. I'm gonna push again over and over and over until like uh, uh, I make you tired or until you make a big mistake, you know? That's great. Now, how do you maintain that concept going through to few to more matches? So let's say you get through the first match, you win, you go real hard in the first few minutes, you, then you, you you rely on the more slippery tactics uh, in the second half. When you have a second and third and fourth and fifth match in a big division, how how does it go from there? Because usually, in my experience, match two, match three, it's everything slippy for, slippery from that point. I love talk about this, and I think that was something that I learned later on. Later on, I was able to study more what I have done before. Before, I used to just do it and then it was worth for me, I just kept doing. Later on in life, I was able to teach my students and I was able to talk a lot more about those stuff. Basic is like a, everything counts. When I say everything counts, like you can't, you cannot go to a match and like a, um, my second match is always better than the first one. This is, you can't, you can't allow that. You know, your first match has to be the best one because maybe you have no chance to the second one. Uh, sometimes my last mat is easier than my first one, the last one. But it's not because I choose that. Because my opponent went so hard before and then he went to the final. He didn't finish nobody. He did all the rounds and I was able to get all the submission. I'm fresh and then he's really tired. So it was not my choice, it was his choice. But on my mind, I want to go the hardest I can on the first mat until the ending. And what I was telling that everything counts, Raya, is that like a, um, I'm looking for to go to the final rest or at least more rest than my opponents. And like today, everything is so organized that many times there's like a big break in between one match and the other. And I feel we're going to be pretty much dry from the beginning. Maybe a rash guard is too wet, but I feel like we're gonna have more grip than five minutes later. Five minutes later, oh, we're gonna be both of that, but I'm taking advantage of that grip. So many times, Ryan, in the moment that I, I was competing, that I felt like a two minutes pass. And on my mind, I was like, uh, I'm getting slippery. I feel the sweat is start to break through. I feel like we're both gonna be very sweat and I start go harder. I went hard in the first two minutes and then I was like, okay, I gotta keep going harder because soon we both are gonna be sweaty and our level is gonna kinda start even out because, because he's used to that sweaty. He probably has trained more in that sweaty. And now I have trained more in this dry situation than him. So now I have a chance to to keep pushing the pace before he kind of gets used to sleep out of the position like we mentioned before. And then surprise, luckily, I was able to finish my opponents way before four minutes in, in, a, in many of the rounds. Just because I have that sense of urgent that like, uh, I have to go now because we both start breaking sweat. And it doesn't matter if it was like uh, my division or the absolute. Uh, even more in the absolute, like I can't, I can't hold this guy this big like a uh, once I get very sweaty, I'm not going to be able to make no grip on him. 
So creating that sense of urgency within yourself really helped you win early on in the matches and, and, and avoid issues from someone being too slippery later on. That, that's that's really cool. Marcelo, there's something I'd love to ask about. You you had so many legendary performances in your career. You faced the, the elite of the elite in your career. And for people that are coming up in jiu-jitsu, the more they compete and the better they do, the more they're going to start rising up to tougher and tougher levels in the sport. What would you advise someone who's 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 a young athlete moving up against tougher and tougher competition to not psych themselves out when they start recognizing people's names that are standing across the mat from them? Because jujitsu is an interesting sport where you can all of a sudden be standing across from someone that you've been watching on YouTube for years. It's like, oh my god, I'm about to fight this guy that, that like one of my one of my favorite people to watch. I'm about to fight this guy now. How do you, how how did you control that during all your years competing for the worlds and ADCC? How did you keep yourself mentally like just focused, no matter who you were facing and no matter how big or small they were oh that, that's so many ways we can answer this this too right and i and i think there's a very very good one that i i, I like to share is that like uh, we're gonna hear so many times that like uh, oh this guy is really tough or oh, the next man the guy is really tough or oh, do you know that guy they go, yeah that, that oh he's a tough one people are always gonna talk about the tough one but everyone is tough Nobody's that stuff, but there's only like a one or two, right? There's only one or two that is like a, that's only one or two that probably is going to get to the final. You know what I'm saying? And those are the ones that you should be, you should be not worried, but like prepare yourself. Like, uh, I was like, uh, I don't want to worry about this guy now. I don't want to worry about that guy now. I'm, I'm on my way to the final. I need to walk my way to the final. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not attached to a names right now. I'm not attached to a moves right now. When I say moves like, a, oh, this guy's really tough because he has a very good this. Uh, yeah. Oh, this guy's really tough because he has a very good this. Yeah, he has a very good this. That guy has a very good that. But then, like, uh, uh, I know there's not that many, like, uh, great guys in the division. Like, uh, it's going to be one or two sometime. I have watched the names of people that is on my, my division. And I got to say, like, that's so many very good guys that compete in middleweight, you know, or maybe one seven division. I, I promise, like, I have I have competed in some divisions that I look, I was like, uh, how? How are we going to beat all these guys? <laughs> what I'm trying to say, like, uh, let's, let's just think for last, 16 people. I have looked for 10 names. I was like, 10 names. I was like, all these guys are going to give me, like, a hard match. All these 10 guys are going to give like a, a very solid like a, a, a technique to match my my moves, like a 10. But then my, this is what comes first on my mind. I was like, oh, it's going to be a 10 like a tough guys on my division. But right, we end up competing against four. Yeah. And then I was like, uh, what about the other six? The other six will lose to the other guys. And then if you worry about like those 10 guys on a division and not worry about just the four matches that you have to deal with, I don't have like a f four strong opponent. I have like four matches and those are the ones that I'm worried. I don't know which one is going to pass. I don't know which one is going to, they're going to match with which one. All I know that like the next one is going to come, the next is going to come. And I like to believe they're not all that great. Maybe it's going to be one or two that those are the ones that like a, probably has the level to make to the final. But just the name, just the move, or oh, this guy has a very good guillotine. I have here so many stuff like like that little thing. Is like, oh, this guy have this very good. Yeah, but it's too little. This is too little compared to so many jiu-jitsu moves. Like uh, so many times, like uh, you're able to compete against a very strong, a strong opponent that is very good in one thing, but very good. I mean, like uh, he has finish so many people with one thing. And then you're like, you just have to avoid that one thing because that's what he's great of. So you can be good to have, to avoid that one thing that he's great of. So I don't like to fight against that. I don't like to fight against names. Uh, I don't like to fight against like a, a great move of my opponents that people say, oh, he's very good on that. Like I, I'm, I'm basic, just folks like, okay, I'm gonna have like a four tough match, but not like a 10 names. And not like a 10 different moves that I know he's good on that. I know he's good on that. And that people come tell you that. So I'm focused like, okay, maybe one of those four, one of those four is going to be a really tough one. And that's the one that probably we should be on the final. If you meet first in the, in the, in the division, that's okay. If you meet in the end, I'm ready for that too, because I just mentioned to you, right? I'm, I'm preparing to get to the final. 
I go the hardest I can in the first round because I want to go rest to the final. So everything will count. So that's kind of like part of like a, uh, how I deal with, with that, those situations that we, we do every time we go compete. Every time we go compete, it's like, a, oh, who's your first bet? And then you say the name, it's like, oh, he's really good on that. And I was like, oh, I know he's really good on that. I don't need to know now that I'm about to go compete him. I already thought about that. But those are the things that we, we have to deal with. You know. That was an excellent breakdown. So there's, there's a few things you said that I really liked. One was the idea of condensing down the numbers of people you're thinking about. You're right. At the end of the day, there's only so many matches. You don't have to fight everybody in the division, thank God, right? Uh, the Secondly, uh, I like that you pointed out that if you have someone in your division that has a good blank, whatever it is that they're specialized in, you, you kind of know what to expect. That's the good news. The good news is know, you know what to avoid and what to look for and what to expect. So that's nice, too. Another thing I wanted to explore there, if you don't mind, is have you ever had to deal with the intrusive thoughts while you're in a match of thinking about the, how many more matches you have to go? Because I know that I've been through that myself in competition and I've talked to other people that have the same problem too is they'll be in their match and they're kind of getting tired and then you're thinking, oh man, I still get like three more matches after this. How do you deal How do you deal mentally with, with knowing that there's more matches coming while you're you know really having an intense fight in your first or second round? Yeah, that's tough, right? If, if you stop to think about the next mat, like you're in the wrong place. You know? yeah. When I say in the wrong place, your mind is, is your mind is not there. You know, and if it's something like that goes through my mind, I'll try just kind of like uh, focus right now, focus on what you're dealing with right now, and just forget about it because that could come to your mind. So basically, basic like uh, it's not supposed to be that hard, but it is hard. But you have to just focus what we're doing right now because that's what is more important now. You know? So that's, that's during the mat, during the mat, like don't think about the next because you have to do this right now and try to do everything best to avoid this. But I have, have those, those bad thoughts after the mat, mm. after the mat, like, uh, for example, right. I have finished the mat and I cannot close my hands. Uh, yeah. I was like, I didn't think about that during the mat. I was, I was struggling with a really tough mat, and now I finished the round, I cannot close my hand. And then I was like, uh, oh, this is going to be sucks. The next round is, like uh, <laughs> is going to be like uh, uh, worse than this one. And 10 minutes later, my hand is good. My hand was fine. I did a stretch, and it's like, okay, that first thought was bad because it made me feel like uh, un unsure, not trusting myself. 10 minutes later, my hand was already like a moving, but then I'm still thinking, I'm still thinking, okay, once I grab again, as soon as I grab hard again, my arm is going to get tired again. This was, keep thinking, this keep coming on my mind. Right, I went to the match, I went to the second match, very important match, I was able to finish my opponent in 20 seconds. Wow. Do you understand? Wow. So, so what that taught me, taught me that like, it doesn't matter how bad it is, don't let that bother you. Don't let that be more important than what you have to do. I wasn't ready. I was, I was, I was very unsecured. I went to that second mat with my hands still recovering from the mat before. And that was making me very insecure. But then I was like, I have no other choice. I have to go. I cannot wait like, a, oh, okay, let me come back tomorrow when my, my arm is full recover. So I didn't give me that many choice for myself. But on my mind, I was feeling very insecure. But then I was so worried about the moment. In 24 seconds, I was able to finish my opponent. And that made me, that taught me that like, uh, okay, it doesn't matter how bad it is, you shouldn't be thinking about the worst right now because now is not the moment. There's a better thing that you can think about. Things that make you feel stronger, things that make you relax because we have no control from exactly what's going to happen. So don't think about the worst. Don't think about the bad thoughts. Don't let that kind of like a, uh, push you in a, in a bad direction. No, that, that's great advice. Yeah, intru intru I call those intrusive thoughts. They're the thoughts that, that I, I'm trying not to have them, but they're creeping on me. They're sitting on my shoulder. And uh, so that's I, true. I, I appreciate you giving the advice on how to deal with them. Have you ever been in a situation where, say that you're, you, you had a hard battle in one round and your opponent just won their round in like 30 seconds? Did you ever have a, a situation where you were going in real tired knowing the other guy just had an easy round the last round? And if so, how did you, how did you manage that? Um... I don't, I don't remember one exact moment like what you just said that I have a 
tougher mat and my opponent has like a, a quick submission. But right, that, that was a moment, right? The, when the alliance is split up, that the alliance was really small that I was one of the few competitors, at least the only black belt that was still competing, you know, that I didn't have a teammate to help me. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Like, uh, sometimes you meet a teammate and then teammate let you pass. So many times, right, I looked at the other side, um, my opponent just passed the round because somebody let him pass. Mm. Sometimes twice in the row. So on my mind, I know I just did two extra mass than my opponent. Obviously, that's that's not fair. No. That's like very like an unbalanced. But one more time, I just don't let that be stuck on my mind. I just I just I just accept reality. They're like, okay, I have to do more than him. That's okay. I can do more than him. I I can do better than him. So those are the thoughts that like uh, we have to push into our mind. And I promise uh, it's just as bad as we, we just, you just mentioned before, but it feels more like a, okay. Yeah. But I deserve more feels more like a, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm try harder. Even the, the intuitive thoughts like come into your mind, but I'm, I'm literally try push them off with like a better thought. And it's just like, it's an exercise that we have to do it. Everything counts, right? I feel like everything counts. You know, you know, when people talk about superstition, yeah. superstitions yeah so it's kind of it's kind of like what i do it's like i always try find good superstition on my mind it's like yeah but he's doing that but i'm doing this because i know this is better than that so my i i try find sometimes it's very superstition but on my mind i keep making stuff that makes sense that makes me feel stronger than than the bad thought that we just have you know what i mean that's great. Marcel, a lot of people learn these kinds of things through jujitsu, through the martial art of training, you know, the pursuit of the martial art of training jujitsu. They learn how to balance their emotions and stay mentally sharp and work hard, work well under pressure and things like that. Do you feel like this aspect that we're talking about could have been done without competition? Or do you think that you really learned how to do all this through your years of competing? I think you can. You can do it every day on the mat. Every day on the mat. Every day on the mat, you can kind of exercise those things. But that's something right in the in the competition in the tournament that is 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 more scar, you know. Once that happened in the tournament, once you go through that in the tournament, and I'm saying the tournament like uh, go through the the same thought, the same like uh, uh, situations before the tournament makes you much makes you makes much more scar on you you're gonna remember much more you're gonna you're gonna go through that with so much more emotion than every day in the train because we get we can get very comfortable at home when i say at home like in in a in a gym home you know? and some gyms they're lucky that they have lots of visitors that helps too makes you feel like oh i'm going somebody new Oh, I'm, I'm not, I don't know this guy that I'm training right now. He can be good. Oh, he looks like he has a, uh, a old brown belt. He can be really good. So those, those helps, but I feel like, uh, even the tournament, like, uh, it's going to be way stronger than that. You know, you, you're going to have much more like a scar. Your memory is going to be much stronger from something that you go through. And I feel like it's much easier to exercise those, like, uh, uh those like a uh, mental uh, scenarios, like uh, when you're in the tournament, you know, and that's what I miss, you know, from the, from competing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I think that, I think that training with your friends day to day, like on a Tuesday night, uh, obviously you, you learn, you learn in the Academy all the time, obviously, but when you prepare for a tournament for weeks on end, when you go there, when you get warmed up, when you step out in front of all the people, everything seems more significant. And so whatever happens, good or bad, like you said, it leaves a scar on you, whether it's a good scar or a bad scar, you, you either, they, they seem like more significant lessons just because of the anticipation and the preparation you put in and then the adrenaline being a part of it. So I appreciate you sharing that. Cause yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with you on that point for sure. Marcella, I'll tell you what, we've reached a, uh, the halfway point of the show here. This is where I, I always play a game with my guests. This game is called the pummel. Uh, the pummel is a series of random questions. Some of these questions are about your jiu-jitsu and some of them have nothing to do with jiu-jitsu but if you'd like to play the pummel with me i'd love to play this game with you okay all right i can't remember if you played the game uh, the, the pummel game last time you were on the show you might have uh but we'll, we'll play again anyways uh question one what's the worst job you ever had in your life um i think i did that before maybe yeah, i answered the same thing maybe maybe 
uh, I have to change the floor in my parents' house. Oh, yeah. And to change the floor, I need to break like a concrete floor to put like the, the, my, 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 my parents want to change like a, a, a wood floor to a, a tile floor, to a hard floor. And I remember when I have to break those concrete floor, I was like, oh, I don't think I want to do that for a living. That was that day that, that was the day that I realized like, that's not much like one option for me. I want to avoid that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's there's no shortcuts around doing something like that. That's that's hard labor for sure. That was nice that you did that for your parents, though. That was that was cool of you to do that. But that's intensive labor for sure. Uh, Marcella, what do you think is a secret talent that you have that people don't know about? Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's the talent, but I'm very proud of that. You know, I can do the Rubik's cube. You know oh I mean? yeah, okay, yeah, you're pretty, you're pretty fast at it. <laughs> not fast, not fast, but like uh, you know. Two minutes. Hey, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, I'm 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 proud of that, right? That's like twenty minutes faster than I can do it. So congratulate. Two minutes <laughs> to me. Two minutes is fast. <laughs> how how long have you been? Have, how long have you been doing that? Is that something you've been doing since you were young? Oh, it's just it's just fun because I I taught my my kids. I learned because I want to teach my 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 son, and maybe like a two years, you know what I mean? Three years. And something that like I always do because I don't want to forget. I took a long time to figure out I don't want to forget. <laughs> That's outstanding. That's really cool. What's uh, what's something you wish you were better at? Anything anything besides besides something in jujitsu, something outside of jujitsu that you, that you wish you could be better at? All right. Without think that much, I would say like a uh, uh, run. I wish I would better run. Uh, maybe music. I wish I have more talent to music. You know. Those are both good options. Those, do, do you have a trouble running for long distances? Or, or yes, yeah? I run anyway. Run short distance, long distance. I don't think my body was was made to run. But I learned something good out of that. The day that I told Sheik Sheik Tanu, the one that invent the whole Abu Dhabi. Yeah, he told he told me like a. Uh, yeah, but we're not made for run. We are made to wait and fight. You exactly. know? So I was like, so I was like, okay, I take that. You know, I guess I'm, I'm that one too. I'm not made for run. I, I wait and fight. You know? That's good. Those are wise words from the shake. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Like, man, you're yeah, people need to run from you. You don't need to run from people. That's ridiculous. <laughs> what What do you think is uh, the best advice that you ever received in your life? Um. I, I don't know why I cannot think about that right now. Right? Just okay, okay. I have I have a very good one, you know? and I'm I'm still exercise that, you know, and it's something that uh, I have to I have to say that like uh, I work really hard on that, you know, and it's not easy for me. Uh, do things to people and then and then don't expect anything back. Mm -hmm. You understand? That's something that like a uh, uh, I'm learning that I'm exercising every day. You gotta do you gotta do things to people and just turn back and don't don't wait for anything. Don't don't wait for recognition. Don't wait for anything like that. And I I have a hard time because I feel I'm the opposite. When somebody does something for me, I just want to return the favor. I want to do right away. So I I feel like I want to do that so much to people. Every time somebody. Uh, extend a hand for me i just want to give it back something right away or as soon as i can and i you think that works to in both ways and not so i'm trying to never expect anything back you know what i mean when i when i do something for somebody you know that's actually and i learned that and i learned that from uh my close friend who is someone who's very uh part of my family libori libori uh, master libori he's the one that has has taught me that you know i'm someone that's very much like you like if someone does something nice for me i really like to go out of my way to thank them i like to show gratitude and even little things for me like if i let somebody in in traffic and like if i stop my car in traffic to let you in then you don't even wave or <laughs> they just go i'm just like that's that's like, what i'm uh, talking about Those like, the little know, things. <laughs> hold, hold the door hold, I mean, the, hold door. the door it's like it's like man you don't like nothing like not a thing just nothing just just oh, okay just 
They, they just exist. Like some people just exist in their own world. Like everything is just expected. They walk through doors. People hold it. They need to get into traffic. People let them in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. I, I have to get better at that one myself. What's your favorite bad food to eat? Your, fa your favorite junk food to eat? Uh, is my favorite and the best food for me is like Chinese food. Chinese know? food, yeah. Yeah. What do you order? Uh, general to so chicken, uh, garlic sh shrimp. You know all those, all those greasy. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't have, I don't have every day. I don't have not even once a month. But those are the ones that when I eat, as I know they're just not good for you. you know? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, Chinese food is something else. It's, it's 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 addictive though, and I don't know if that's because of the the MSG salt that they always put MSG in. MSG. Oh, that's that's the key. Uh, that's, that, the key. that's the key. That's how you keep them coming back, man. The taste is <laughs> yes. good, but the MSG keeps them coming back for sure. Yes. It's funny, you're from the region of Brazil that I think has the best food. Uh, Mineiro food is, oh my God, it's so good. For, for anyone that ever visits Brazil, try to go to Marcelo's state. It's called Minas Gerais. And they have like, it's all like country, it's like soul food. Kind of, it's just, it's so good. Oh my God. So I think so. I, yeah. I think it's more like a soul food. That's the way you can describe it. Yeah. It's delicious. It's amazing. So yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, it, good, greasy, oily food, man. There's just something about it. Now, now, what's something you cannot eat? Like, what's something no matter what? what you can't touch you know you know i don't know the name in japanese the sea sea origin oh sea you know the, yeah 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 i i tried that they people give it to me because they say it's very expensive oh you should you should eat this one is a good one I, I don't like that thing you know i try and i can try i try again if people say like no this one is better i'll try but it's just like a doesn't go well, you know, wasn't for good. me. You know. Wasn't good. I don't know that I've had that before or not, but I've heard people say that they didn't. I haven't heard anyone say they like it so far. So that, most of the people say they like. Right. Really, I just really. Can't. You know. Yeah, I can. Was it was it the texture or the taste? What what bothered you more? Both, Both. but most of the taste. I don't. I don't have problem with texture, but then when you taste and it's bad, and then you have the texture right at the same time, it's just like a. You know, it's it's not good. It's terrible, unfortunate. terrible experience. Yeah. No, I understand. I understand. What do you think is uh? What do you think was the scariest moment of your life? Ooh, that's that's some that's some tough ones. You know what I mean? Um, when my kids was born uh, premature. Oh, I'm gonna try to stay quick before I get emotion. And the, and then I was in a I was in the in the delivery room waiting to my kids to born dad you know that was the scare moment you know they prepare me to go to the go to have go to see your kids be born but they're they are about to die you know that's what they told me so that was the scare moment of my life and they're wrong you know what i mean i have my beautiful daughter i lost my son but uh i have her to just you know keep me going you know that's incredible. I appreciate you sharing that, Marcelo. I'm sorry about your son, but man, that's a, how old is your daughter mm -hmm. now? She's, I, I, I saw her. She's staying. Yeah, she was running <laughs> and playing around in the background when we were starting. So she's obviously very healthy, doing well, huh? She's staying. She's great. You know, no, no complaints. You know? That's amazing. Does she do jujitsu too? Uh, she start, and that's one of the main reasons why I need to, I need to open a gym here in Hawaii. You know, not just to have a, a place for me to train, but I want to teach them. You know. They just started in New York and then we move here. They need to go back training. That's incredible. Uh, do you think you're going to open your, your school on the main island there? Yes, yes. I hope to open here in Kailua. You know, that's, that's where I live. I don't want to have to do a commute because I want to stay home, you know, with, with my kids. So, so I cannot go too far, you know. Incredible. That's so cool, man. Uh, Marcelo, every time I ask people, uh, I would say 50% of the time when I ask people who their favorite grappler of all time is, everyone almost always mentions your name. But I'm now going to ask you the question, who's your favorite all-time grappler? Uh, guys, that, that goes back, you know what I mean? goes back on, on Hicks on Grace, you know what I mean, I guess. You know, that he's always my idol, you know what I mean? He, um, who have lived that time when people used to talk Hicks like like a like a legend? It was just like amazing. I mean, it was just like a hard to, hard to beat that. That's a great choice. How about how about your favorite MMA fighter of all time? Mm, I I didn't think about that much, right? I I, I can say names, obviously, but. Um, 
let's say Damien, you know, I mean, Damien is definitely like someone that is so close to me, somebody that, uh, is very like a dear friend of mine. You know I mean, I'll, I'll say Damien, you know, excellent choice. Yeah. That's mine too. Definitely. Uh, what do you think is your biggest phobia? What's something that, uh, something that freaks you out? You know, your biggest phobia. Right. I'm, I'm, uh, I fight so much against those things. Like, uh, uh um, as a kid, as a kid, I was very insecure. So every insecure I have, I, I, I burst through today. You know what I mean? Every, everything i try to go like against, you know what I mean? If it's something like, uh, makes me insecure, I, I feel like I, I go through because I want to, I want to, I want to face that, you know, but I like to share one thing, you know, um, as a kid, like, uh, um, I, I don't think I was a sick kid, but I ended up in the ER a couple of times, you know what I mean? With, with a cold, flu. I don't even remember what it was because I was too little. And I remember when my mom talked to the doctor and was like, okay, we're going to go to the pharmacy to get the, the shot. And I was like, all right. When I was a kid, if you want to make me freak out, you just say that I need to get a shot, you know what I mean? And, and I was able to face that fear uh, when I was 16 and I decided to have a tattoo. Oh, nice. So on my, so on my mind, on my mind, I was like, uh, I didn't know how feel tattoo, but on my mind, it just needles yeah. on my mind. It was like four hours getting poked by needles. Obviously it's not the same thing at all. But on my mind, I was like, I need to face my fear and still get my tattoo because I want so bad a tattoo. I want a tattoo so bad. And that makes me fight my fear to get a shot. And as you guys can imagine today i have got so many shots from blood sample bl uh, chemotherapy and ryan every time i go get a shot you know what i mean today i always look through i have to look see the needle go through because i'm still facing my fear wow. I, i'm not saying i have fear anymore but today i feel like i need to go look and they say oh don't look you, you don't have to look i was like i want to look because is a fear that was with me for so long. Today, when I do a blood exam, like I always look through, you know, and I'm fine. But it's it's fun because my son had a hard time to get like a vaccine shot today, and then reminds me a lot of myself you know, when I was a kid. <laughs> I hate I hate getting shots and blood work too. I don't mind tattoos, oddly enough, but I hate that too. I, I and, but you're man, you're you're one up on me for sure because I can't look. Like if, when they say, "Okay, you ready?" I'm always looking the other way. I'm like, "Yeah, okay, go." <laughs> I, I, I can't look at it. I can't look. Exercise, just just exercise. Right? I'm gonna try. It's, it's something right. that I'll it's try. Something, you know. I'll do it for next time I get my blood checked. I'll I'll, I'll say okay, this was for Marcelo. I'm gonna look. I'm not gonna look away. I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that I did it for sure. Um, Marcelo, what do you think is your favorite kind of music to listen to? I only have one favorite. I listen to everything. But I only have one favorite. It's the punk rock, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, the, the Ramones, you know. Yeah, the Ramones for right. sure. All right, nice, nice. Yeah, I love the I love punk and the Ramones. That's uh, that's awesome, man. Right? Can I can I share one thing? Yeah. With you about the about the needle thing? Yeah, please. Um, I got I got a port, right? Yeah. I don't know if everybody port. knows oh, yeah, what is yeah. a port. The port. Yeah. This is just a scar. I don't know if people can see this scar. I can see it. Yeah. I already took it. I already took it out. Thank God, you know what I mean. But a port is something that they put over there that they stick the needle inside. That's why I get the chemo straight to, to my body, not just like in the vein, but goes like a, goes, goes more to the center of my body. I don't know how to explain that. And right, I got that one day. You go to a sur surgery, you go, you go sedated, you wake up, you have a cut over here and you, there's a big lump on your, on your chest. And they, they always poke that to get you the infusion, right? That's the problem why I didn't get to train jiu-jitsu. Not just the chemo, not just the cancer. It was the port. There was just like a hard ball on your chest that kept moving then it was not supposed to be moved because it's attached to your artery. You know what I mean? And, and Ryan, the next day after I get my port, you know, I, I, it was like a good scar. They go and they're like, do you want to try your port? I was like, try my port? Like I just got a surgery yesterday. You know, it's still very, there's a cut over here. You know what I mean? And the, and the nurse told me like, are you scared? 
<laughs> right when she told right when she told I was this guy, I was like, I was like, no, I'm not. I, I was already fighting my fear. I was I was not fighting her. I was fighting my fear. I was like, I'm not scared. No, I'm let's 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 try my port. I don't know what does that mean. <laughs> Ryan. My my port was so sensitive, probably was too swell. All the blood vessels were still recovered from the cut the day before. Right. When she sticked that needle, it was a big needle, big needle. A inch needle, thick, not just needle like a shot, thick. Looks like a, you know those those stuff they put in like a in a in a chair. That nail they put in a chair so the oh, chair yeah. does it, it, it slide. It was a big needle like that. Oh. And when when she pushed it through my chest and they were so stiff, I felt my whole arms numb. The pain was like one of the worst pain I ever had. Oh my god! <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe. I was like, I can't believe like I'm doing this today. And then later on, the pain was fine. I would, later on, like two weeks later, I have to do it again. It was fine. But I saw everybody was every time it was gonna hurt like that. I was like, I can't believe that. You know what I mean? But one more time, I was just fighting my fear. I was like, she thought, are you scared? I was like, I was like no, I'm not scared. Then you know. You know? But it was the worst, you know? Oh my God, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, that's it, it, I, like I'm I, I'm okay with like smaller needles, but anytime like like for example when, when we had uh, my when my daughter was born, they used they they showed us the needle that they were going to use to put in the in my wife's uh, the epidural needle or whatever they call it. Yes. And I saw that I was just like, oh shit, I can't watch. I got to. So I was holding her hand. Yeah, that sucks. That sucks. I'm yeah. like, dude, there's no way. Oh my god. Yeah. If you're afraid of needles and they bring out something that looks like a nail, that's gonna be a that's gonna be a bad one. But again, well, good thick as a nail. Oh man. But again, good for you for looking at it and for 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 being brave enough to to, to go through that. <laughs> I, I would have passed out, man. I would have passed out. What's something you spend way too much money on? Oh, there's so many stuff. When I say so many stuff, like when I like one thing, I'm just obsessed with, with that thing, you know. Uh, probably where I have spent the most money, think fast, my bicycle. Your bicycle, yeah. Probably that's what I have, yeah. And, you know, bicycle can go really expensive. Yeah. I was lucky. I was lucky that I don't, I don't like a road bicycle. What can go to like a 20-something thousand money, dollars. But I think probably that's what I have expended the most. Oh, I, and I, I gotta say, like my cooking utensils, my cooking stuff, probably I have spent a lot of money on those stuff too. You know. Now, now we talked. We talked about your secret talent. I didn't know you cook. You, you can. You, you're a good cook. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. I, I I didn't know it was a secret because that's something that I I I always post and people. I think people relate to see me cooking sometime. But that's something that I'm proud of too, right? You that's know. awesome. What's your favorite thing to cook? But people knows. But people knows. You know. What do you like to cook the best? I don't think there's one thing that I like most. Uh, my kids, they have a hard time to eat. They're picky. Uh, I make everything from the scratch to them. Maybe I'm the one that making them more pick. But I love any recipe that takes a long time. If I have a recipe. If I have a recipe that has so many steps, that's my favorite thing. I like to just enjoy that longer. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? That's cool. So it's like a th so it's like a therapeutic. It's like a it's like a, medita a meditation kind of thing for you to to to. I feel. Yeah, I feel. That's really cool. I wish I could do. I, I'm I'm probably the worst cook that's ever lived. Like I, I mess up ramen noodles. So like anything like the easiest things. I burn toast. I mess up if it's not like a microwave meal or like a bowl of cereal. You don't want me making any food for you. That's something I I really need to get better at that. Myself. <laughs> yeah, you won't like anything I make for sure. Um, let me pick another one here for you, Marcelo. What do you think is your um, oh, okay. Here's another question for you. So again, you, your name gets brought up almost every time I ask this question. If you had to pick four faces to put on Jiu-Jitsu's Mount Rushmore, what four faces would you choose? Um, Roger, Bushesha, uh, Fabio Gorgel, and Hickson. Excellent lineup. Great choices. You didn't even have to think very hard. You already knew you, you knew your you knew your favorites. That's awesome. That's a I know. One. If I think too much, we're gonna start like a <laughs> overthinking. That's a that's a that's a question that usually takes a, a long pause for most guests. I like that. Um who's someone in history that you wish you could travel back in time to meet? Oh, definitely Joy Joy Ramon, you know. Joy Ramon, nice. nice. Yes, yes. That's a good choice. What's your favorite place in the world that you've been to? New York for sure. You know. Yeah. I, I assume that I got there the first time, Ryan. I got there 
I was doing what I have to do over there. I was doing, I was shooting my first instructions over there. And right. As soon as I got there, I was like, I was like, I can't believe maybe I cannot, I never go back to this place again. Like, uh, Oh, I can't believe I, I'm enjoying this place so much. And maybe, maybe it's one of those places that maybe I never go back again. I was so worried about like, uh, maybe I'm never going to have a chance to come to New York again. Cause it was really so hard to go there the first time. Like, uh, I took so long. I never been outside the country, stuff like that. And then on my mind, I was like, oh, I can't believe maybe I'm never going to be into this place again. You know what I mean? But obviously, surprisingly, I ended up living there like a, um, for so long. You know? That's outstanding. Yeah, New York's an awesome city for sure. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. It really is a very unique, unique city. I like Sao Paulo. I like Sao Paulo, right? If you like Sao Paulo, I feel like you're gonna love New York. So that's why, like, it was easy for me. You know? that, that's funny you say that because people ask me what it's like in Sao Paulo. I say, man, it's 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 like a tropical New York. I said, if if you like New York City or if you like big big uh, uh, urban sprawls, you, 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 but but exactly. tro a tropical version of that, you'd like Sao Paulo. I always think that Rio Rio reminds me more of like L.A. It's more like a surf culture kind of beach culture, whereas Sao Paulo is more of like a business, uh, uh, theaters, shows, music, food, art, that kind of. Thing. And and Ryan, I I feel like I make São Paulo my São Paulo, and I felt I make New York my New York. Like people complain a lot about big city. People complain a, a lot about like uh, traffic, uh, pollution. People complain about people. You know what I mean? Oh, so many people. People is rude. People is rude to you. And stuff like that. But I make I make that place my place. What I'm trying to say, like uh, I was lucky enough before move to New York. I was living like a walk distance to the gym. So I was able to walk to this. I don't have to drive the whole week. I don't have to drive in Sao Paulo. So I used to drive just in the weekend to go to the mall, to go watch a movie. So I didn't really hit bad traffic. In New York City, uh, the last 10 years, I, I live wall to wall to my gym. So New York was, so New York for me was just there. It was that block, do you understand? So like a, when I want to see more people, when I see a crowd, when I go somewhere different, I go. But my daily was just like a go walk to the gym. Like a, a, I cannot even say it's around the corner because it was wall to wall. You know? That's incredible. Yeah, that, that's something I've really enjoyed about living here is that um, I'm from Atlanta, as it's where, it's where my family is, it's where I grew up. Atlanta is, is a great city, but everything's very spread out. Like if you don't have a car in Atlanta, that you're not going to last long. It's not like the kind of thing that you can take public transportation to anywhere you want to go. You can't walk to practically anything unless you're really in the city. Um, and here in Sao Paulo, like, man, I walk out of my apartment and like, you know, five feet from my door is, is a, is a pharmacy. And then the other way is a bakery. I can walk 10 minutes to Damien's Academy. My kids go to school five minutes up the block. Everything's like, like you said, it's all right here. Like in our little neighborhood. That's what I mean. It's been, you awesome. make your place, you know what I mean? Yeah. You make your place, you know, you make your, you make the experience that you want it have you know what i mean exactly yeah yeah so i think yeah for big city living has been has been a lot of fun in that way for sure uh marcelo final question for the pummel game if a zombie apocalypse happens right now in hawaii what's the first thing you do Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i love i love walking dead i'm not happy with the last seasons of the walking dead but i always enjoy i'll, I'll definitely get a gun you know <laughs> Get ready to go, huh? You're gonna. Yes. Are you going on top of your roof, or are you gonna? Are you gonna, are you just gonna stay where you live, or are you guys gonna leave the area? What do you think's the best thing? Uh, I, I I go either way. Face those zombies. I know. I if it's if it's the same zombie from The Walking Dead, I feel that it would be easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. All, all you have to do to get Marcelo to fight the zombies is ask if he's afraid of them. Like Marcelo, are you afraid of the zombies? <laughs> like no, man, no, no, no. I'm not afraid of them. Let's go. <laughs> Look, I have seen myself in those situations so many times when I watch The Walking Dead. I was like, why they just don't keep poking them in the head and that's it? You know, they all die so easy. And they all they all rotting. You know what I mean? Already. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the scariest zombies were. Um, did you ever see the movie Twenty Eight Days Later? Yes, those are too fast. Those, those are too fast. When they're too fast are, and they're too smart. Yeah, that was different. That's what I mean. It's like, you know, there's some zombies like, you know, the regular zombies fine, you know what I mean? Yeah, see, that was a black belt answer. You're trying to figure out which zombies I'm talking about. It depends which movie, for sure. Yes. And uh, Marcelo, that was the final question for the Pummel game. Congratulations, you win. You get your double underhooks.
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Marcelo, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit on technique. So, obviously, you're arguably the best ever to use the butterfly guard in competition. So, uh, we, we saw you use it against all the elite opponents you faced, some of which were twice your size. Um, when, when you're seated in front of someone trying to attack with butterfly guard, what do you think are some of the most important details when making first contact? Like, what are you usually looking for from the start? I want to get under, you know. When I say get under, and when you say get under, it doesn't have to be on the hook. You know? I just want to get under my opponent. And when I say get under, it doesn't mean I want to get smashed by my opponent. I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel his his strength. I want to have a control of his weight, and that's what the butterfly guard gives to me. You know? uh, it's, people like butterfly. People has learned the butterfly guard, but it's people. It still gets surprised when I do butterfly guard to other people today. You know, I do butterfly soup and they're like, oh, uh, you do butterfly guard really well. They're so used to don't be swept by butterfly guard because they think they already know. They think that's it. They understand. But no, like uh, there's a lot more to do in the butterfly guard. Basic what I'm saying, like if you get under, it doesn't matter if the guy is small or bigger. I think that's the best lever you can get when you have uh, a butterfly guard in somebody bigger than you, for example, you know. What are some guidelines you like to follow in regards to not getting passed when you're playing butterfly? Like, what are some things that you cannot allow your opponent to do? Um, everything. This is like a basic. This is like a base of my jujitsu. Like, I don't let my opponents get a grip on me, get a control of me. When I say control, I'm talking about the grip fighting. I need to have the grip control. I don't want to let my opponent control my hands. I need to control my opponent's hand. Even if I don't have a hold, when I say control, I don't need to hold my opponent. I don't need to have a hold on my opponent's hand. I just need to have a control. When I say control, I control the distance. Control that I know his hand is not control my ankles. His hand is not, is not, uh, surprise me with like on the hook. I feel like, uh, those are, those are the main thing. And based on, on that, like, uh, uh, I'm always trying to surprise my opponent with, with something new, right? You know. What do you think is one detail about the butterfly sweep that you see a lot of students miss? Is there any one thing that over and over you see people missing a particular detail when they're developing their butterfly guard? A um, couple of things, right? We can go very detail on that, but the most important is the grip that I just mentioned. The second one that I mentioned before was get under your opponent. When I lift with my hook, I want to be the closest possible so I can get him up. Um, because I'm going to have a better leverage. My leverage is going to be much closer. That's, that will make it way stronger. But another one, you have to just stay sitting up. I don't go to the butterfly guard and fall on my back. I go, I go on the butterfly guard and he stay sitting up until the moment is, is to until the moment is is to go sweep. I get all this control that I mentioned before, and when I know it's time to, I fall on my side, not just not even on my back. I fall on my side, going straight to the to the sweep. You know? What are some of the subtleties that exist between your, your when you play butterfly guard in gi versus when you play no gi? I know you said earlier you like to train in both gi and no gi, being mindful of, of, of having good grips that are comparable to, to gi and that, that are comparable in both realms. But are there any subtle details, anything that you do different, say, in the gi that you might not do in no gi? If you have the butterfly with the gi, obviously you have so much more grip, but not just the grip, but you have a belt. You know, if you have a belt control to do the butterfly guard, it's so much easy. You gain so much more time, not just the control, but you just kind of like, a, you can take your time to develop like a, a better control to, and then you go the sweep. No gi, you have no time. You don't have the grip. Once you find like a little bit of grip to the butterfly guard, you have to go. So the time would be like a crucial on that, you know. That's great. Between gi and no gi. Yeah. You know, obviously, Marcelo, your game is, is a game I've studied since the time I was a white belt. And something something I always appreciated about your jiu-jitsu is how you would transition so well, especially within your butterfly system, to X guard and single leg X and, and, and all the places that that, 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 that uh, guard can take you to. How important is it for you, for students, to develop a map of places to go from butterfly? Like, if, obviously, you have your butterfly sweeps and you have plenty of attacks you can do from there. Is it really important, do you think, to simultaneously be developing an X guard at the same time so you can switch back and forth? Or do you think someone should focus mainly on butterfly for long periods of time first and then branch out? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say they have to be one of the other. You know? I'll I'll prefer to recommend like a you need to have a guard that you do 
when the person is on his knees, you have to have a guard to do when the person is on his feet. Those are the two options that your opponent is probably going to uh, give it to you. Maybe he's going to pass your guard from his knees. Maybe he's going to pass your guard from his feet. And that changed a lot. When I say change a lot, right, uh, I cannot do butterfly guard if somebody's standing up. There's no butterfly guard when somebody's standing up. Gi or no gi, no butterfly guard. So I feel I need to have uh, a set of technique that I can do when the person is standing up. Yeah. And there's so many other moves that you can be great. You can be great. And sometimes you cannot do when the person is on his knees. You have a great move, you have a great sweep, but now that he's on his knees, now it doesn't work. To get under somebody that's on his knees, you're going to have to work really hard. Sometimes if you have a very good leg attack and the person decides to stay on his knees, like a, you're going to have to work extra hard right now. So I, I like to choose the moves that like a play based on the options that my opponent probably going to put me into. Yeah, absolutely. Well, another aspect of your game that I've always noticed you do is when someone is trying to pass from the knees, you'll oftentimes use arm, uh, arm drags from a butterfly guard to take their back. Uh, how important is that uh, as, as, to, to develop as well? Like being able to, to take the back from butterfly, um, is that something that people should work on early on, you think? Like the help a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, arm drag has been a long time. I was in practice arm drag. And because maybe one of the first moves that I got recognized, so people was always like a, expect me to do the arm drag. Sometimes people was, people was going to roll with me and then they want to arm drag me. So it was always like, a, I know that was so much obvious that. And then I, I took a long time without doing the arm drag. And then today when I do the arm drag, I was like, oh, it's easier now. I feel like people are just forgetting to defend the arm drag. So what is good? So the arm drag helps a lot the butterfly guard that I mentioned, but not only that, but at the same time we have guillotine too. So from the butterfly guard, I have a very good setup for the guillotine. So that, that catches a lot of people by surprise. Imagine butterfly sweep, arm drag, guillotine. You have like a very good options right there, right? <laughs> it's a lot to deal with for the opponent. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Does your, does your strategy or the positions that you play or the options that you use change at all if you're going with someone that's significantly bigger than you? Uh, did you have other things that you'll tend to gravitate towards depending on the size of the person? I would like not to because my technique is already supposed to be work against somebody bigger or smaller. Most of the time, the techniques that I do, if I do against somebody smaller, it's supposed to be easier. It's supposed to be easy, not always going to be easy because you can have like a, a very uh, easy big guy and you can have a very tough, like a small guy. So it's not always easy. But I feel, I feel my moves are already being tested and I train against the biggest and the strongest opponent. But um, most of the time, I feel like it would be easy when I do against somebody smaller. Even you know you have to be more precise. You don't have as much open because somebody small. You don't have the person, the, the butterfly, the, when you try to do the butterfly guard, the person doesn't have that much like a leg that you can just hook under and lift. You have to really kind of like a connect more to your opponents. So you can do a little bit adjust, but it's supposed to be easy because I feel like the moves have been tested before against the biggest guys, you know. That's outstanding. That's excellent. Well, guys, any, for anyone out there listening that wants to improve this part of your game, you've got the very best in the world showing you how to do this at bjjfanatics.com. Uh, his instructional on this topic is one of our absolute bestsellers. It's called The Complete Butterfly Guard by Marcelo Garcia. It's available right now at bjjfanatics.com. Also, guys, we, we have a brand new feature on the website where we've added the option to add flow charts and visual notes to select instructionals. And Marcelo's Butterfly Guard instructional is one of them. So when you pick up the instructional, be sure to check the option to add that because it's going to accelerate your learning if you use those tools. So head over to bjjfanatics.com and check it out. And Marcelo also has several other instructionals with us there as well if you're looking for other areas to improve upon. If I, if I can share something also about the technique. Yeah, please. Uh, please. Since, we, since we talk about the butterfly guard, right? Yes, please. Um, I feel like we always need to be learn something new. We always need to be learn something that like uh, your opponent doesn't know. And in reality today, everybody kind of knows everything. And today, people always go with everybody. If everybody do one thing, everybody wants to do the same thing. And I feel we can go the opposite. We can go the opposite. If, it's, if, somebody, if a lot of people are doing one thing, I want to do something else. I want to do something new. I want to do something different. Basic, what I'm trying to say, like, uh, if everybody's doing, like, uh, ankle lock, uh, leg and tangle, 
is already old because everybody's doing that. So you need to look for something new. If everybody's already doing like a, that kind of style of thing, like a, you're already late, you know, because if you start doing that, everybody's already doing that. You need to do something new. You know? And obviously I want to sell my structures, but I, I need to share that. Like uh, I wish people would take more advantage of that because there's a lot of techniques over there that people hasn't developed yet. And I know it's just like the extra edge that you can have against your opponents. Like, for example, like I did instruct like uh, attack the attacker Oh, there's so much, there's so many thoughts that I put over there. You know, I have uh, another instructor that I appreciate a lot. What is a mount? People doesn't know me from a mount attack. I think I've, actually my last submission was from a mount. You know, I mean, the ADCC final. But people doesn't see much. But I have developed so many like a mount attack that people doesn't know. And you need to do things that people doesn't know. You need to do things that people like. Uh, it's not it's not just popular that everybody knows. It has to be something that will surprise the opponent. And that's kind of like the, the technique way that I like to approach it. Uh, when everybody's doing one thing, I'm trying to do something else. Because everybody's already doing that thing. Everybody already aware about that thing. I want to do something else. And I feel like that's part of like a, why I make my moves work against my, my opponent than another ones, you know. That's really great. Now, let me ask you this. When you're looking to do something different from what everybody's doing, are you typically looking in the direction of innovation, like taking something that, that that's like like creating a new variation or a new uh, concept based off of something that already exists? Or are you going back into the toolbox and finding old school techniques and bringing them back because maybe people haven't been thinking about them? Like, where do you like to draw from? I guess let's, I'm trying to say. Let's do both. Uh, I don't think we can invent the wheel every day. You sure. can't, you sure. know what I mean? It's the same move but in a way that people doesn't know. Mm. It's the same move, but in a way that people is not expecting. You know how to do the triangle, but there's so many ways that you can do the triangle in a way that people like is not used to uh, see the triangle be setting up. And that's what I'm trying to say. Like, uh, uh, I, I'll be very like uh, cocky if I say like, oh, I like to invent a move every like uh, three months. And I mean, I, I can't do that. I don't think I never did that. I got recognized by a lot of moves. I won Abu Dhabi by I did a lot of back attack. The Al Abu Dhabi did a lot of guillotine. The Al Abu Dhabi did a lot of north south choke. I was not trying to invent a move every day, but I was trying to do moves that people wasn't training. Moves that if people is not trained a move to do, people is not trained to defend. If people is not used to do that move, okay, uh, um, people doesn't know north. Let's imagine people doesn't know the north south choke. Okay, people is not practicing the north south choke. So people is not defending the north south choke either. So that's kind of like what was my mentality. I look for a move that people, I, I was looking for a move that was underdeveloped and I put a lot of time on that because I want to do something new. And then surprisingly, uh, that has worked for me. And I realized like, oh, I didn't know that move can be so popular, you know what I mean? And then become so popular. So I feel that I, I feel that it's still a lot of moves underdeveloped that we can go there. We don't have to invent, we just have to develop more like uh, options in the same moves that we already know. We can, we can learn a new just move every day, but we can get better our move every day, you know? Well, it's kind of like what happened with the leg lock, with the leg lock wave. Like it was an area of jujitsu that was being underutilized for a very long time. And then, uh, you know, Danaher and a bunch of other people started using leg locks and it became this huge wave. And I think there's always something, like you said, there's always something that's, that's getting the most attention technically in jujitsu. There's always these trends. And like you said, wherever there's a trend, there's something else that's not being looked at deeply. So that, that's, that's really cool that you pointed that out. What do you feel is something that's not being looked at a lot right now? In your opinion i would say something that i know when i say that i know like uh, uh something that um is on my mind right now it's still on my mind it's still very fresh i still train every day um side control attack and mount attack i think people let a lot of people uh get out of, of the side control and then they pass the guard again they 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 go past someone's guard like more than once. I don't think you need to pass someone's guard more than once. You can pass the guard once and finish your opponent. Or you can get the side control and then people are like, okay, I'm going to let them turn back to me. And then I can and then I can finish him from the back because it's easier. We, we have so many techniques developed from the, from the back. But I believe there's a lot of uh, attack and submission and finish that we can do from the side control that people is not doing yet. And, they, and those are perfect when people doesn't want to give the back when people doesn't want to give the mount. 
But then at the same time, I like to, I know there's a lot of moves that we can do from the mount, especially in no gi. Especially in no gi because people had hard times to develop grip. So they feel like, oh, it's easy to finish somebody in the mount. Yes, it's easy when you use the gi, you do, you do gi technique. But it's easy to finish somebody in the mount in no gi too when you do a no gi technique. Just don't go look for the gi when you have like the mount position. So those are uh, two places that I know that still very underdeveloped in no gi. What is in the side control and the mount position. Maybe it's because people is not really try past each other's guard. You know what I mean? They just want to win in advantage. But I still feel like uh, that is a big edge that I want to teach my students that. You know? I want to get them better on that. You know? Yeah, that's outstanding. Hey, there, there's something you mentioned earlier, Marcelo, that I really wanted to uh, explore too. You mentioned you have an instructional called Attacking the Attacker. And that's a really interesting topic because I think that a lot of people in jiu-jitsu end up getting stuck in defensive cycles. Like they, they end up defending against when someone else is on offense. It's kind of like we, we subconsciously accept that it's their turn. And so we go into the defensive mode to defend their attacks. How do you turn that around on an attacker? How do you attack an attacker the way you said? Oh, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you point that because that's exactly how I feel. Uh, I don't want to get on that cycle of defending, defending, defending. And now I'm just tired from defending. It's not that I cannot defend. It's not that you don't know how to defend. I, I hope uh, everybody practices the defense. But if you just keep defend, 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 your opponent just attack, attack, attack. He's used to attack, attack, attack. So you better just don't, don't be under somebody attack for so long because maybe you're not used to defend that move for so long. So basic, I like to attack my opponent. But I realize sometimes your opponent is not scared of you and he's not intimidated and he's going to attack you at the same time. But at the same time, when I get attacked, I need to attack back. I need to recover like a, that, my chance. I need to recover like a, my time. So I like to respond my opponent's attack with attack back right away. Obviously, we need to defend. You cannot always like attack at the same time. I'm not counting my opponent. I'm just like, as soon as he attacked me, I'm attacking back right away. So I can push, I can get a distance, I can hip escape, I can avoid, but I'm ready to go back on him right after. And that's that's kind of like a, uh, the theme of my my instructor, attack the attacker. You know? That's excellent. You know, it, it sounds like it sounds like a, a lot of that has to do with just competitive mentality as well. And there there are a lot of people in jujitsu, I think, that sometimes struggle to to turn on that aggressive switch. Like they they kind of get into this kind of flow state where they're flowing in their jujitsu and kind of taking what comes their way. And it can sometimes result in them being a little more passive uh, and and not understanding when it's time to turn on the aggression and when to go. How do you how do you encourage students to develop that that killer instinct that you that you're describing? Look, you just talk about the competition, the aggression, the 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 kill instinct. Like uh, those stuff can be bad, but but Ryan, you can do the same thing and still have like a health train. And I think I did that in New York. I think we were able to train really hard in my gym, but at the same time, we can be like friendly with each with each other. And I feel like that's part of like a, what I believe so much. You can train really hard. You can have that kill instinct. But it's to have a, a, a health environment, and you can do that. Don't think like, oh, I don't want to just go be too rough on my on my train partner. I just want to go flow. You know, I feel like you can still develop like a, a fast pace, a strong pace, like dynamic, like a, a jujitsu, and you still don't feel like a, you 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 bullying your your training partners. I mean, not not anything like that, you know. Something a lot of people run into, too, on that note, Marcelo, is that I've noticed that there's some people who and they've, they've told me this in private, like, man, when I'm going against, let's say I'm a purple belt and I'm going against a black belt, I feel like there's opportunities where I could attack the black belt and go for it. But I, but something inside me makes me feel like it's wrong to do that. W what are your feelings on that? Should, 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 do, you think, do you think that people mm -hmm. lower rank should be trying to tap a black belt or is there a layer of respect that should remain intact there? Look, respect is important in every environment in our life. You know? But you're there to learn jiu-jitsu, you're there to try, you're there to try and miss and do right or, or whatever. So it's a lot about your environment. You, know? you, have, you have to be in an environment that you allow. If you're in an environment that you're not allowed, then okay, that's different. The environment that I'm used to, you, you, you can. You can attack the higher bell. You can try like a surprise your... your 
a higher rank. You know? And I think that's that's helpful for everybody. The higher rank doesn't want to go somebody lower belt and always have like an easy train. I, I feel like that's just like a, a uh, it's against learning. You know? I mean, you, you want you want to have somebody just try something new on you, you know? and that's and that's health. But at the same time, you gotta feel like a, the environment welcome to that. You know, that's that's so many vibes that I've been. I was like, a, I have been some environments visiting somebody that I felt like, oh, I don't want to just go hard and be the first one that I'm gonna try uh, guillotine this guy. You know, what I mean, I, I'll feel like uncomfortable. So it's a lot about the environment too. You gotta have a little bit of sensibility on that. You know, I I like to build the environment that the lower belt can't ask a higher belt to train, and the higher belt can say no. You know, what I mean with respect what's wrong with that you can ask uh, a higher belt and he can say no if he doesn't feel like oh today's not a good day for me I, i'm not feeling good today i don't want to go with you you a lower belt you're gonna go too rough i'm not feeling good today that's okay you understand like but i like the environment that anyone is allowed to ask anyone to train you know and if you go train he can go hard too but obviously like depend on the environment sometime you know what i mean yeah yeah i think you can balance that really well Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I always say that one of the best academies, one of the best environments that I ever visited in my time doing jujitsu was your academy in New York. When I, when, I, when I was there, there was there was an absolutely an energy of obviously tough, good training. You were a lower rank. There wasn't this culture where you couldn't ask someone to roll if they were higher rank than you. It was a very uh, open and family oriented place. What are some things that you um, that you've seen in other academies, some cultural things that you always wanted to avoid in your own schools? Uh, I have a good one. Don't talk and train. You know, that's that's when things go bad. You know, like you think like, oh, we we is a is a is a fun environment, is a easy environment. But that's when, when you talk too much and train. When you talk during during train, that's when people interpret it wrong stuff. So a way that I was able to avoid those things in my gym is like, okay, now it's time to train. It's fun. We all friends. We all have a good time, but we don't talk. You tap, I tap, we don't talk. Even like you think like, oh, I I say something like I thought was okay. And then the person, uh, you rob, rob the person a different way and then he didn't like. And then like, so I'm not even talking about jokes. Jokes like forget about when you train hard, if somebody joke about something, then the person like uh, interpreted it in another way. So I feel like uh, I go to some place and then people talk too much. And when I say talk too much, I don't care. People can talk. I, I can't ignore the talk. I can't stop a conversation. To have a conversation, you need you both to talk, right? So usually I just ignore and I like to just stay focused. Uh, you know, you tap his hand, let's go again. Let's not talk that much. But I know I know that's kind of a recipe for uh, a misunderstand during the, the role, you know? Yeah, I, I could definitely see that. That's something that's one of my one of my pet peeves too. Like if someone makes a comment like, oh, that was nice or or uh, or so, you know, if they're kind of, they pay me a quick compliment for something I did that was good. Obviously, I don't mind that. But yeah, if people start com conversing during the role. It's kind of like, man, come on. We're in the middle of a, we're in the middle of rolling here. Exactly. I'm, I'm, play, I'm playing chess with you here, man. I'm trying to think, you know, I don't want to have a conversation right now. Um, it's like you can say you can say a word like you just mentioned, like you just say like, oh, that was nice. Like I, I like to say. Sometimes I, I catch some people in the train and then they say like, oh, I was like, and I, 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 I respond. I'm not that I ignore. I'll say like, uh, yeah, don't let me do it again. You know, just, I say something like that, but it's not something that like, you know, it's not like a, a miss commentary. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Marcelo, what do you think is the hardest thing about being an academy owner? What, what do you think is the hardest thing to manage? Oh, uh, let's talk about the ego again, right? It's just the ego, but there's a lot of things, you know, uh, right. But the ego is definitely, definitely a, a strong one. Um, and today, I feel there's more distractions than before. You know? Today, everybody can be very popular and recognized and famous, you know what I mean, in, the, in your own world, in your own social media. I think I think probably today is like just like a, uh, the distraction, the distraction that those things probably will give it to you because you have to do the social media. I feel like it's health for athlete, it's health for like a, a competitor to be in the social media. Today I recognize that I didn't know that in the beginning. I didn't have social media until like a uh, until I don't even know how long ago. Not that long, I guess. At least not as long as as long at least not as long as everybody. You know what I mean? I didn't know that was important today. I know that 
but you have to avoid distraction because the same way how I told the they you mentioned to me the intruder thoughts, you know what I mean? Like uh with the social media, they can come home with you. you know what I mean, you can be like a you can be in your bed reading stuff and then those thoughts can be just kinda like a push you back, you know, not not moving forward, you know. Absolutely. It's funny. I remember when you when you opened your Instagram account, it popped up on my thing of like people you might know or people you might want to follow. And I thought, oh, Marcelo, it's like, I know I couldn't find you previously on Instagram. So I was like, oh, I guess he just doesn't do social media. And so I clicked on your profile and this is when you first opened it. You had like 300 followers. So I'm like, oh, this isn't Marcelo. I said, this, this is someone, this is someone, this is a fake account pretending to be Marcelo. And then like a month later, I see it again and you're up to like 50,000. I'm like, okay, that's Marcelo. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so Right. So, I like people. <laughs> right. I like people you okay. understand like a, if you like new york city it's because you like people yeah. you understand so I, I like people but i don't like i don't prefer the social media yeah do you understand i'm the social media i try to uh, uh be there you know what i mean I, I want i want people to be able to find i answer people people i, I get a lot of message you know at least for myself i feel there's a lot of message yeah. maybe i'm not as popular as like the most people but i feel i get a lot of mess i answer people but i prefer people like like talk to people you know what I'm uh if somebody see me in the street want to talk to me like uh, uh look we can stop like 30 minutes depend what i'm doing like uh, to talk about whatever in jiu-jitsu whatever who feel will be a, a good thing to talk but i don't want to i don't want to have most of my time the social media that's 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 something that like I don't want to be distracted with social media. I, I I go there every day. I check, I see I see uh, message. I answer like uh, the quick ones. Sometimes people ask me technique. Oh, this is so hard. I I can't answer technique during uh, from the Instagram. You know, because yeah. yeah. I'm I'm so I, I, I'm 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 very passionate for something. And then if I have to write it down, I don't think I'm gonna take like a couple hours if I have to. <laughs> express uh, a way to do jiu-jitsu uh, from the Instagram. Yeah. But I would prefer to just talk to people. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like people. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, I've always said if it wasn't for the podcast, I probably wouldn't have social media at all anymore. I, I think that I think that there's there's a lot of good that it does, obviously, but there's also a lot of bad that it does. And so I think one of the easiest things to see in everyone's life is just it makes you real, like you said, distracted. It, it's something that kind of you're always kind of hostage to it and, 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 and to some degree, you know, some people are really addicted to their phones and social media and others are, uh, you know, not so much, but at the end of the day, I think that it is something that is a distraction from, from healthier things you could be doing. So mm -hmm. have you, have you seen this Google, this uh, Apple glass, these glasses now that are coming out from, from Apple? Have you seen? I saw an Apple one. Uh, you know, that's a weird one. I, I went, I went to Apple store. <laughs> And then when I went there, I was leaving and I look at that. I was like, I stopped like for one minute watching that. I don't even touch that. Yeah. Uh, I just felt like uh, um, I was fine. But then I was looking at that thing, you know what I mean? Make, it was just make me think, you know? <laughs> Have you seen people use it yet? Have you seen people like in the street, uh, like walking around using it? Saw, I saw Casey. Yeah. Casey, exactly. he's, yeah. He's, he's one of the biggest like vlogger, you know what I mean? I guess maybe the first one. Yeah. I saw him. I saw his last video about that in the subway obviously it was in it was in new york city yeah it was really cool it was really cool you know? it's 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 neat the things people can do with it like i was watching a thing where someone was using um the, the, they were using it to set up windows and screens that that pin to different areas of your house so for example if you're cooking you can pin a screen like a little window of a cooking like i'd say like a day of uh like a gordon ramsay uh video of him showing how to cook something and you can have that floating always over your stove and no matter where that's you go, amazing that's it, amazing there's some pretty cool stuff that people have they have like a grow grocery list always pinned to their refrigerator but then you're always walking around with like these terminator glasses on throughout your house i don't know it, right yeah Every, everything i cook is from youtube everything yeah, I cook is that's from where YouTube. you learned yeah. that, would, that would be a big help you know what I mean? because <laughs> i always put the video i always put a video to follow the recipe you know what i mean i might have accidentally just sold marcelo on the on the uh, on the apple glass no, no, so no, you no. might have to go back to the store and get it now man no <laughs> do you know do you know why because like uh, one thing that makes me confused about that you know uh look I live in Sao Paulo a long time. I'm from Brazil. You don't want to be distracted, you know what I mean, when you walk in Brazil. You understand? We don't even use a phone in Brazil, outside a house, you know what I mean? Because you can just get robbed, you know what I mean? Uh, 
uh, when you're in the street, I see people on the phone in New York. Uh, I, I almost feel like they're gonna hit, get hit by a car. Yeah. You understand? Know Sometimes they, they use the airports, they're riding a bicycle. Oh, uh, that's so dangerous on my on my on my on my mind. I, I think it's not a good combination. Uh, listen to music when you ride a bicycle. Obviously, like today, you can you can manage the audio. You can listen to outside and still listen to music. Maybe that could be better. I don't I don't have tests yet because I always feel so scared about like when you're doing one thing, you have to just kind of like be aware about when you ride a bicycle. I always ride a bicycle in New York City, and I think I ride pretty hard. You know what I mean? I want to have the awareness around me. And when you when I think about like the 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 VR thing. Uh, Right, I think you can be very distracted about what's going on, like a, a car and you know, somebody, you know what I mean, that can hurt you. you know what I mean, I, I think you, I think you better have a, a good awareness around you. That's because that's how I feel about jiu jitsu. You know what I mean, it's a lot of awareness. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, like, if someone's walking around the street, and I understand you, it's, 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 you know, their glasses. You can see everything in front of you, but there's also an interface now between you and whatever you're doing, where there's like pop-up windows and messages, and people are literally walking down the street doing this with their hands. It's like there's no way you're really actually paying attention to your surroundings, and especially if someone's trying to talk to you. Like, wouldn't it feel weird if someone's wearing glasses and you're talking to them, but you know that there's other things going on on their face that that, that you can't see, but they can like that, that i don't know right i have no experience on that i'm just giving my opinion like i have no experience on that but at the same time it, it's a little bit about like a me be introvert you know what i mean like uh, when i'm talking the phone i prefer talk in the phone than than text i don't mind to text but at the same time i prefer to talk but even when i talk i don't want to be loud around people you know what i mean imagine has like the the astronaut you know what i mean <laughs> goggles you know what i mean like a uh, uh, I'll, I'll feel very like a show off, you know what I mean? If I have this on the street, you know? even in New York City, you know? Yeah, for sure. You mentioned crime and stuff like that. Have you, were you ever, did you ever have any incidents happen to you in either Sao Paulo or New York? Uh, I was so lucky, right? I, I can't complain. Sao Paulo was great to me. Uh, I, I never got robbed in my life like that, like gun rob or knife rob, you know what I mean? Um, but I noticed it was very close. I know, you know, when you feel like the, the crime is very close to you. Yeah. I, I, I have that sense when I was living in Sao Paulo. And that was something that I was always trying to avoid. Many times I was taking a bus at night. Many times I was going through a, a, a very dark uh, aisle to go to somewhere else, to go to Damian Maia. I have teaching on his gym for a little bit. Yeah. I remember to walk from one place to another was like a, uh was literally sketchy so i remember those are mo most like danger moments that i felt i felt the danger you know what i mean but i never was robbed so i was, I was lucky and one more time like i mentioned to you is, is i was i always have a good awareness you know what i mean i was always try to uh, look what was surround me you know if i need to go a little bit faster if i need to wait sometimes you just feel like oh it's not time to go just wait wait to more people go and then you go together you know those are the stuff that you have to learn, you know, when you, when you're from Brazil. You know. Street smarts, yeah, you pick up street smarts for sure. Yeah, I've been real lucky here too. I've never had any incidents. I had my, I had my phone. My phone got walked off with. I, I was not paying attention, and my phone got, got, got. Uh, someone picked it up and walked away with it. But other, but in 12 years coming here, that's the only thing that's ever happened to me. So, um, I've been pretty lucky too. But I think I'm also pretty, pretty aware too. Like it's, it's if I'm in a, if I'm out, if I'm not in my house, I already see people from way before they get get anywhere close to me. I'm very, I've, I'm, I'm very paranoid. You know, uh, <laughs> about yeah, those things. I hate to say paranoid but at the i don't think it's paranoid i think it's just it's just being aware you're you're hyper aware you know and i think that's like like for example like uh, every time I, I still have the habit i go through i go past close to people <laughs> i put my hands in my pockets and check my <laughs> wallet you know I, mean? I do this you know, thing is, where... is a habit is a habit that i'm never gonna leave i guess you know? <laughs> when i'm walking in crowds if we're in like a subway or a crowded place i do this thing i call it brushing all i do is as i'm walking my hands with each step kind of slightly brush my pockets so that way I'm, the, 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 there's, <laughs> there's never more than like two seconds where my hand is not brushing and touching my pocket that way if someone ever tries to reach their hand in to pickpocket me it's it's, it's gonna be kind <laughs> <laughs> they have to be really good. They have to be really good. But usually, what they do is they distract you. It's usually like two or three people working together. Right, like some, right. Yeah. I have a friend of mine. I have a friend of mine that starts to argue with somebody just looking. Oh no! In the bus, 
he was just looking somebody in the bus and then he didn't realize he was getting robbed. Uh, <laughs> somebody was robbing. Friend, yeah. Exactly. Somebody was just staring at him and then he starts to kind of like look at him and then he's looking at him. And then when he left, he's like, oh, where's my wallet? You know what I mean? Gone. It's gone, my friend. It's not with you anymore. So I, I, I was never going to pick that fight. Somebody looking me in the bus. I was like, I don't look back. You know what I mean? I just like, you know, yeah. I'll take care of my own business. You know I mean? Yeah. I think if, if anyone like stops to ask for directions or tries to talk, if someone, if, if a stranger tries to stop the chat with you, my hands are pretty tight to my sides because that's usually how it works. That's, that's, that's the type of awareness we're yeah, talking about. They distract you. Where did you teach at Damien's? Did you teach at Damien, uh, Damien's first academy or at Villa Duluth? The first one, the, the first, first one. one. Yeah. yeah, up on the up on top. It's been of the hill. so it's been yeah. so long. It's been so long, uh, Ryan. Uh, it was in Pinheiros, but it's been so long. I I need to go back and try to memorize all this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. All, all the all the neighborhoods, all the names of the street, the bus that I used to take. You know what I mean? Like. A, well, he's yeah. It's funny. All three of Damien's academies have been within like a mile radius. So the first one was in. Uh, it was called Justino Amer Justino Americano. I think was the name of the street. It was in Alta Alta Pinheiros, like you said, and then Villa Deluta was in Villa Leopogina, which is right down the hill. It's not even very far. No. So what's the first one? Was yeah, the first, the first one. one. Yeah. yeah, with the chain. He had he had chain link on the windows. He didn't have glass. It was it was chain link for the for the windows. I don't remember. Don't remember. Don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah, I think he left that around. That, that was that was a time that. Then it helped me because he told like uh, I just need to make more money. I just need to work to. I, I just need to get more work. You know I mean? And then he's like, "Oh, come teach uh, once a week in my gym." And I was and I was going there. You know? That's incredible. Uh, what's your favorite story of Damian Maya? Do you have a favorite story or a favorite memory of Damian? Uh, we used to live. His wife used to live in the same neighbor of my wife. Oh, cool! And I used to live. We used to live together since that, right? So. Um, and Damien wasn't live there, but he was always there because his wife, his his girlfriend in that time or fiance in that time was living there, you know, in Alphaville. And Damien used to ride me to São Paulo almost every day in a, in a motorcycle. Oh yeah, it was not safe. It was <laughs> not safe at all that ride. You know? <laughs> Going from Alphaville to 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 the gym like was was kind of far was not safe yeah. and i i didn't i'm not used to riding a motorcycle especially in the back you know what i mean i was like i was feeling not safe at all <laughs> but then it was a good ride but sometimes we used to hit like a, something on the we felt we know when you hit something with your knee it was like oh that was close you know yeah well, it's good that you have two jujitsu, two jujitsu, two high level jujitsu guys. I all about like keeping your balance and like I, I think you guys. Are I don't probably... know. Go, go, going hundred miles. I don't know if it was it was a good idea for us. I know. think you guys right. are probably safer than most people. Most people that don't have the same sense of balance and control, grip strength. Obviously, Damien's got some crazy grip strength, so that's good. Yeah, Alphaville to Sao Paulo. That's like what like a thirty minute drive, and dude, the traffic here is crazy. I don't know how bike. I don't know how people ride bikes here. My boxing coach rides a bike, and I, I always every time he comes to. to to train with me i'm like man please don't I know. Get we have something. to avoid i know we have to avoid right a motorcycle if you can't you know what year did you first move to new york when when did you leave sao paulo 2006 i moved to new york yeah i was hired by fabio clement to work for him uh i stayed a year and a half over there and then i was already competing and then uh i felt like i want to try something new i want to go back to something that i always wish to do what was mma and i did mma uh, pro, my pro debut, leaving New York, and I kind of trained myself over there. Obviously, I got help with a uh, striker, but basically, I did the, all the other stuff by myself. And then I noticed that was not enough, and then I moved to Florida to train with the ATT. You know, I was trained by by Liborio over there. And after a year and a half, things didn't went the way that I was playing. I was not happy to just train MMA. I want to go back to Jiu Jitsu. So I was able to go back. Uh, I, con I won three more Mundials. I won, I think, two more Abu Dhabis. And I moved to New York at the same time, in that, in that same time. And it was 2009. Yeah. I went back to New York. At that time, did you see a path to do jujitsu full time? Because when when you're talking about the early 2000s, that's that's a time when a lot of jujitsu guys were kind of seeing MMA as the path to make more money and to and to, to make a career. Did you did you see uh, opportunity just doing jujitsu at that time, or is it something that just naturally happened? I was able to do just jujitsu at that time, but already the the price money of, of MMA was already something that like oh that's much more than no gi that was much more than abu dhabi you know what i mean 
that definitely makes you feel like, oh, I feel I want to I wanna make that money too. It's not even compared to t- today, but it was already more. So that's part of why I went to the MMA too, you know, just get more money I mean, make a better leave from something that you already love to do. You know? well, what made you, what made you stick with jujitsu? You think what made you not want to continue MMA? I felt I was missing jujitsu. When I say miss jujitsu, obviously I was missing jujitsu, but I felt I was losing jujitsu. And when I say lose jujitsu, not just like uh, not getting bad or just learn jujitsu. I felt like uh, um, I was hurting my body so much more, Ryan. I fell in MMA, I was making my career shorter because I was trying to learn something new. When I say something new, like uh, uh, I was pushing through my body to learn some moves that I was not always comfortable to. When I say comfortable, like uh, uh, you you, you in, on the ground, you need to get up. So I never have to get up from the ground. I can just, you need to get back on your feet. Uh, you on, on the cage, you need to fight to don't fall on your butt, you don't get take down. So I was always fighting some some scenarios that was that was not something that I was good at it. I was fighting, I was trying to get better. But my I noticed that my body was just feeling like uh oh you're fighting too hard, something that you don't have to. So I noticed I was getting more injured. I was literally getting more injured. My back was getting locked up more. And then got one point that was like, uh, obviously, thing was not going well in MMA the way I was playing to. But then got to one point that I noticed like, uh, I think I'm getting hurt more. And it's not even just the punch. I feel like uh, my back is hurting more. I feel, I feel like the, the life uh, uh, term in my back, I think is getting shorter. And I was, uh, and got to one point I know I felt like, uh, I don't think in a couple of years I can go back and do jiu-jitsu again. I don't think in a couple of years I can go back and, and, and win a tournament in jiu-jitsu if I want to. And then that makes me feel a rush of like, okay, I need to go back and do jiu-jitsu. Surprised I was able to go. I won the Mundial three years in a row. I won two Abu Dhabis. And I think, I think that was the smartest thing that I could have done, you know Oh, for sure. Well, it, was, it also was a very lucky decision, too, because the sport of jiu-jitsu has taken off the way that it has now. And there's so many people that, like, I remember when I first started training jiu-jitsu in the early 2000s or in the around 2005 when I took my first class. Um, man, I remember, that, like, most people that were there were there to pursue MMA. It was either self-defense, they were looking for just pure self-defense, or they were looking to add jiu-jitsu to their MMA skills, you know, so they could fight. And, um, and then it wasn't even five years after that that suddenly you saw that less and less a lot of people were just doing jujitsu to go to the to, to you know compete in the worlds or you know, pan ams or pursue the sport of jujitsu so i think the fact that you decided to stop with the mma stuff go into you know stay with with your with your uh with your passion of jujitsu and, and make those accomplishments that you made that was obviously a really good a really smart decision because ultimately people are now looking for you and your school because they know that you did it the best in the sport. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's really cool. Uh, Marcelo, what, what do you, what, what aspects of, of, of your jujitsu do you think worked best for MMA and what, what, and, and was there anything that didn't work very well in an MMA setting? Oh, Ryan, like, uh, I, I'm very clear. I'm very clear on that. What works and what didn't work. What was more efficient and what was less efficient. I wouldn't say didn't work because you can find somebody that will work against that person. I mean, sure. But I I noticed uh, that I put so much time. I trained a year and a half MMA, very short time compared to all the thirty years of just that I've been doing. But a year and a half training at a very high level with a really uh, top uh, training partners. Uh, was was a very good experience for me, right? I was I was able to collect a lot of experience on that, and I quick learned, especially after my first MMA fight and my loss. Uh, I love to take somebody's back, but I never accept myself have somebody's back and be on my back. Mm. Every time I get somebody's back, hooks or no hooks, I roll the person and put him on his knees. That was a big exercise for me in MMA to adapt. If I have your back, I take the hooks out, I lift you with my hooks, get back on my knees, I make you sit down on your butt with the seat belt that I have, or I make you turn on your knees and I walk some crucifix. Mm. If I have your back and you roll, I let go the back and I let you stay on the bottom. If you try to get out the side control, I take your back again. If you roll again, I let you roll to the bottom. But I never 
ever have trained choke somebody from the back from my back on the on the floor because that's how I lost my first mat and that was a rule that I put on my train that I never did that before but I learned some techniques that I was able to even get better uh, uh, in Nogi you know all those shoulder lock those like head and, and under hook control got so got so much better in, for the Nogi because I use that so much in MMA in MMA I don't know if people realize but every time you miss a punch you fall through those through those techniques and I was constantly inside those those positions I was able to uh, reverse my opponent so many times every time they try ground and ground and pound me you know it's interesting that you said that because that was going to be my follow-up question. Did, did you find that, that that dealing with people trying to strike you allowed you to set up certain things easier? Like obviously, it's oh, so much easier, yeah. so much easier, right? Yeah. It was easy. Uh, I'm proud of that. Uh, look, when you do interview, people want to hear the truth. People want to hear what is in your mind. Sure. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of like uh, I never sat down one round MMA in training. I never sat down one round. Doesn't matter if it was a bad day, doesn't matter if it was a good day, a striker, a small gloves, whatever. I never sat down one round. And I'm proud of that because I see a lot of people when they have a bad day, they throw the gloves out and then they go home. That was never makes sense for me because we don't do that in Jiu Jitsu, but in MMA, I guess people like, uh, they don't want to get beat up the days that they're not feeling 100%, you know what I mean? And, and Another one is that like uh, uh, people used to have a hard time to ground and pound me, you know, and uh, I guess my technique based on what I just mentioned to you was walking because every time somebody try ground and pound you, if they miss one punch, they're stuck. They're inside of that, that control, they're inside of that, like uh, that grip, you know what I mean? So that was something that I was, I was proud in my, in my MMA training. You, know? you mentioned that you, you worked with uh, Ricardo Laborio, another, another legend of the sport. What, what are some big things that you, that you took away from working with Laborio? Was there anything about your, uh, that he added to your game that you didn't have previously? Uh, he took so much time you know, to, to teach me over there. But one thing that I got really good is like people was having a hard time to take me down right after, yeah. after training so much in MMA. I remember that I went to my first or second uh, Mundial and people were shooting a take down on me. I was like, oh, it's going to be a little harder. It's going to take me down. You know? I, my timing to defend the take down was, was really good. You know? And to recover from bad position, don't, don't fall on my butt. I was able to, even when somebody shoot like a, a deep double uh, leg, I was able to really kind of uh, stay on my feet. You know? That's excellent. T to this day, do you work a lot of takedowns and a lot of standing uh, portions of uh, of grappling? I I believe I believe on them. You know, you, you want to have like a, uh, all the dimensions. You don't want to be good in one dimension, bad in another one. I, I I think it's important to be good on your feet, be good on on your pass, be good on your guard. You know what I mean? And have submission around all those scenarios. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of jiu-jitsu people that don't come from like wrestling backgrounds that I think sometimes feel a little hesitant to start working uh, live takedown training because they're afraid they're going to get hurt. They think that, you know, the higher, there's a higher risk of injury. What, what advice would you give to someone that feels that way? What, what's a way that, that they can just dive in? Like, learning? like I mentioned before, you need to learn something new. You need to get out of your comfort zone. But there's like a, a, a safe way to do that, you know, just... Just there's some takedown they can really get hurt, but there's another takedown they can really avoid and avoid the chance to you get hurt. When I say you can really get hurt, I mean like a, somebody pick you up, like a, don't don't try post, don't try somebody lift you up, like don't try post your arm, don't try defend that much. Wait to them to take you down. Sometimes they even gonna put you down because you not try scramble from the top of somebody's shoulder. You know what I mean? But just don't post your hands, stuff stuff like that. So you you can easily avoid some some positions on your feet that w you can get hurt. Like, uh, uh, especially with the gi, you know, and sometimes with the gi, if you try really like a, uh, don't fall, that's when you can get hurt more you know, when you try just stop the, the judo throws, you know what I mean? So you need to know which level you are and somebody find like a good takedown on you, don't try to resist, just let it take it down and then next time don't let the person enter that move again. I feel there's a lot of ways that you can practice your takedowns without you get hurt, you know? Absolutely. Did you do judo when you were younger? I began with judo. My jiu-jitsu uh, begin was was with judo, and that was a very strong base for me. That gives a very strong base to jiu-jitsu. But after a couple of years, I was so hooked in jiu-jitsu, I couldn't be on my feet anymore. Yeah. Uh, I went I went all the way to a, a brown belt. Wow. 
Yes. I went all the way to Brown Belt without score one takedown. Wow. And then I realized like, oh, I need to, I need to get better in, in takedown again because I was able to have a strong base in the beginning. And then after like uh, easy five, six years not doing takedown, I felt like uh, uh, I was not confident. And then I realized, okay, I need to get back on my feet. I need to, I need to practice be on my feet, you know. And that comes together with the no gi too. That helps too. Absolutely. Yeah. I, th I thought I remembered you saying you had a judo, that you started with judo. I couldn't remember though. Do, do you think that later on in life, as, as you became uh, uh, an elite competitor in jujitsu, did you find yourself gravitating more towards judo style techniques for takedowns or towards wrestling? Style? No, more, more wrestling. More wrestling. Yeah. Why do you think that more was? More wrestling. More wrestling. It was easy. It was easy. You know, judo, the, the, I feel like the technique is more difficult in judo. Uh, guys, I'm just saying stuff that like, what I think, you know what I mean? I can be wrong, I can be right, but that's what I think, you know? And the takedowns in judo is, you have to train a lot more to hit them right. And and they avoid a lot of leg attack because it's easier. They avoid the leg attack because they I, I isolated the other takedowns. So if you just do the leg attack. So quick, I realized like, oh, it's so much easier to take somebody down with wrestling takedowns than with the judo. But then, I can't forget about judo. I I, I need I, I still have some habits to uh, to defend the judo throws. What helps me a lot tremendous, but what helps me the most that I still have trained, e even the last tournaments that I did. Um, right, I went to train with the Olympic uh, Center with the with the national team. Uh, win in Sao Paulo, from Sao Paulo. They, they won the team tournament uh, uh, that year. I went train trained over there judo only to grip fighting. Wow. Uh, I took I took my time to go there. They all take me down every day. I, I was going home with my body almost numb because so many like sh shaking and, and throw so hard on the floor. But then I was there just to practice my grip fighting. Wow. Only that. Every time they got they enter the takedown, I I didn't stop the takedown. I just get through. So I I know how the important it is with with the gi, the grip fighting. You know, did that translate over well to no gi as well as far as hand fighting goes? Mm, not little, not a lot. Little, little not a lot. Way. Yeah. Obviously, a little bit of like a, you know, don't let the other person grab, but that's definitely not as close as it is with the gi. You know? The grip fighting with the gi on your feet from judo, they are, they are so much more advanced. They are so much more conditioned than us. You know? Yeah, that's an, that's an area of jujitsu. I think a lot of people that, that compete find themselves a little uh, a little lost in sometimes because a lot of times in, in most jujitsu schools we, we start from our knees uh, or we start in a seated position and that's how the rounds begin. Um, co places that have competition training will a lot of times start from the feet, but there's a lot of people that show up to tournaments and when the ref says go. You're, they're kind of lost. Okay, what do I grab? Where? Sometimes they'll just sit guard just to get things moving. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the best things to look for right from the start when you're on the feet across from someone else in a, in a jiu-jitsu match? Uh, that's what I say to everything. When I say to everything, like, if your opponent pull guard right away, you don't have no chance to do takedown. He just pull guard right away. Just no hesitating. You can't hesitate. If you're on your feet, if you think about like, okay, I want to try taking him down. I want to try stay longer on my feet. You just don't hesitate. And the, re the reason why I say no hesitate because um, you can surprise your opponent so much if you're not hesitating. What I'm trying to say, like you both, you both a uh, little nervous. You both like a uh, little bit like unsure how you both going to start the match. So if you have the 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 initiation to like no no I I know what I'm gonna try to do right away, uh, that puts you so far ahead. And with the takedown that comes together like a perfect you know if you have one takedown just begin a match and go and do it right away. Obviously you have to set it up, do a perfect setup. You go like a the way they have to do, it, but just go first. Don't wait for your opponent. You know. That's excellent. Yeah. So be, be, be first to act. I like that. It's something kind of along the lines of that. Um, are, are you of the school of thought that generally speaking, students should be focusing on having one thing they do really well, or should they be trying to focus on sort of 
an overall well-rounded game because there's some people that think that having one good go-to move in, in each position is the way to go and there's other people that want to try to have multiple options no matter where they are for most students what do you think is the best way to go about that when you're when you're learning i think they can be exposed to everything they can go every day and and see something new but they need to they need to be guided in one direction you know they, they what, what i'm trying to say like a they can go to the class and learn something new. They can go to another class, learn something new, but they need to know what they're working now. They need they need to be like a, a guide to one direction first, one direction at a time, because uh, reality, right? Like uh, we don't learn technique just when we stop to drill in the middle of a class. I feel like uh, we learn techniques before you even before before you start a class. Some people they come they come out and then they drill a little bit, or sometimes they ask question. Uh, sometimes you learn techniques after, you know, you just went through a tough train and you realize like, uh, oh, I didn't know I was so bad in the guillotine. You know, I got cut in the guillotine like five times today. So you need to go and try exercise those stuff after, right after, like just go over details, ask somebody, hire a belt, ask your instructor, somebody that is near you, you know. Uh, but what I'm trying to say, like, uh, it's good to be exposed to a lot of things top bar everything that your your instructor tell you to train that day but you should be trained one thing you know what I mean? mostly when it comes to developing that one thing do you prefer to do uh positional sparring or do you drill repetitions a lot on something that you're trying to uh, on? i have very like very specific opinion about that and i and i like to learn the move i like to drill the move and know they're like okay i know how to do it right I already did, I already drew this move 10 times right. I did 10 times right, right. I, I, I repeat the moves. I know I know the move is perfect. It's timing perfect. But now it has to be live. Now I need to I need to hit that move live. That's my opinion. So I feel like it's enough to you to drill the move. It's enough for you just do it and until you able to uh, execute the move right. But then after you need to try against against somebody life not it's not going to be easy but you have to push to try to do against somebody that give you the uh, a live reaction and doesn't have to be the same belt as you it could be somebody lower belt than you it could be somebody with lower experience than you because if you white belt there's no uh, somebody lower belt than you but somebody that just have less experience so you just gotta try the life and when i say try the life like you just drew the move the move is fresh in your mind go and try it, you know and probably gonna miss the first time. Maybe you're gonna miss the first week, but I promise you, you're getting better based on your opponent reaction. That's great. a lot faster, a lot faster than if you just drew hundred times your opponent giving to you. You know, absolutely on the drill. I that's my belief. Yeah. No, I 100% agree with you. Do you do you typically try to achieve that by doing positional sparring, mm -hmm. or do you try to just mix it in as a goal to your normal roles? Exactly. That's that's the responsibility of your instructor. Your instructor has to uh, guide you, like I mentioned before, in something that will be helpful for most of the team. Like, oh, I noticed that everybody's just not getting good to defend the heel hook. You know? So he goes and put you most like in the in, in a scenario that probably gonna be have to defend your your ankles. You know, and stuff like that. And I strongly believe on that. Like a, a specific train, like a. a when I say train, it's not just like a, a different position. It's not just like, oh, let's just get out the side control. Let's just get out from the mouth. Let's just attack from the back. Let's just attack from the from the from the guard. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like a, your instructor is very important that he invent a different scenarios. When I say scenario, it's not just position. It's a scenario it's like a, it's the same position. You train that position every day. You you already know how to escape the side control. But then now you pass someone's guard. You on top of side control. But the scenario is that you losing. Do you understand? Like so, the, your instructor can have the the creativity to every day make a different training based in different scenarios. Like you can be on top inside somebody's guard. You inside somebody's guard, and then the instructors just say like, "Okay, now you guys have one minute to get out of that." And who is inside the guard is losing, and who has the close guard? Like uh, in those scenarios, like comes very handy when we try to develop and learn a better technique. That's great. A lot more than drill for my 
understand. On that same note, like the idea of being mindful as an instructor to, to guide your students and to design drills and, and, and things like that, that, that help everybody simultaneously. How often do you combine two different problems that you're seeing in the room? Like, for example, let's say that you're noticing that some people are having trouble passing half guard while other people are having trouble entering into leg locks. Will you, will you design specific training where top person from half has to pass, top person from bottom has to enter into leg attacks? Do, do you do things like that where you're taking care of two problems at once? Yes, yes, for sure. But you, you can you not always have to do that. You, you not always have to kind of solve two pro two problems at once. But you can definitely figure out scenarios for that. And that and that makes it really fun for me, right? I, I enjoy I enjoy do those stuff in the train a lot. It's follow the rules. When I see the rules like uh, uh you need to have an opponent that can really can really like uh, put himself in a scenario that like that you told him. It's like, okay, you only have to attack. Doesn't matter if you lose or not. You only have to attack. You lose in the meta already. Doesn't matter if you're going to make a mistake or not. I just want you to attack. So I love when, when the group, when the, when the team, they should understand in that scenario and they, they just push through. You know what I mean? and, I, and I think that's kind of like what makes just more fun. You know? That's awesome. That's so cool. So, so when you're analyzing your class and your students, how do you t how do you typically recognize when 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 there's an issue that multiple people are having? Because that that seems like a lot to pay attention to at one time. I mean, I, I suppose you're, you're experienced enough that you can maybe do that. For for someone that's newer to teaching, what advice would you give to kind of understand problems that are existing in, among more than one person in the room? Uh, right. Sometimes people come ask you. you know, Sometimes. Two people come ask you after training and you realize, okay, that's like a common question. You know what I mean? Sometimes you show one move and then you realize like, oh, wait a minute, I'm showing this move. I want you everybody to do this, but everybody's doing this other thing wrong at the same time that, I, that I'm showing this move. I didn't realize that they're, they're doing this bad too. Or I didn't realize that I, I didn't realize I didn't explain right because everybody's doing wrong. So I, I, I can easily figure out like something that I'm missing. You know what I mean? But the, easiest way and it's so obviously after a tournament uh after being the tournament and watch like a, a, i have had i have have like a 50 students competing one day after a tournament that you go that coach and, and then you, you literally realize like oh i know exactly what is missing today you know because i've been here all day i've been coached like multiple students and i realized like oh everybody was like uh uh not having not have initiated the takedowns, for example. You know, it's easy to see those stuff like after a day of the, in the tournament. You know? So, so those scars that get left on the competitors can get left in the coach's mind too. Uh, if it, oh, it's, it's so it's <laughs> almost like more upset. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. It's great though. It gives you it, it, that's really cool how it can give both the athlete a guiding point uh, and and the and the coaches too. That, that's really cool. Uh, it, Marcella, do you have a really specific curriculum that you put your students through? Like, if someone signs up at Marcelo Garcia Academy day one, does everyone on day one take the exact same class? We have we have now. We didn't have that way before. Before was a lot different jiu-jitsu, right? Before was everybody together, a big class, you know what I mean? A mess. We have we have to admit. And today we definitely like, uh, have the alliance curriculum. You know what I mean? That's, I don't know if people always remember that, but I'm still under the alliance. All my, all my war titles from blue to uh, black belt and Abu Dhabi has been under the alliance. So we, we follow the Alliance curriculum. The Alliance curriculum is a very rigid one. I've, I've actually looked through it myself because I've got friends that, that run Alliance schools. And uh, yeah, that is a very, very, very organized and well laid out curriculum. So I could see how that helps for sure. So Marcelo, have you already looked at locations for a school in, in, in Hawaii? Have you, have you already begun that process? Yes. Like, like I mentioned, I, I live in Kailua. It's a really small town. Uh, we have a very good school over here. That's why we stay here. Obviously, I, I love the people too in Hawaii, but I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna somewhere close to my house. Uh, like I mentioned before, I live in São Paulo. I, I need to live close to the gym. Uh, I live in New York. I need to have the gym. I, I need to live close to the gym. I live over here now. I wanna build the gym close to my to my to my home. You know, I know the reason why I have a gym because. That's how I connect to people. When I say connect to people, like I have a friend, I have students that come visit me, you know what I mean? I want them to have a place to come see me, you know what I mean? So I feel like I, I miss that, you know what I mean? And that, and that will help a lot, you know? 
That's outstanding. And what, what do you have any idea timeline when you might have a school open? Uh, maybe a couple months. Oh yeah, right. Quick, that's huh? that. That would be the plan, you know. That's great. That's outstanding. And Marcelo, final question for you: What are some of your other major goals for 2024? Just the, besides the uh, besides the academy, anything else that you're hoping to accomplish, either in your professional? Um, or Obviously, I want to stay health. I'm, I'm, I got I got a lot that I'm, I'm figuring out about my body. That I, stuff that I can eat, stuff that I cannot eat. I'm just I'm still on that process to figure those stuff out. Is is a big part of like of my um, healing is to know stuff that I can eat, stuff that I cannot eat. Those are the stuff that I'm. I, I gotta say I'm still struggling. <laughs> There's some stuff that I I thought I can eat and I realized okay I cannot eat that either because I need to avoid acid, acid food. I need to avoid citric fruits. You know what I mean? I need to avoid a lot of, I need to avoid a lot of health food that you think is, uh, that would be good. But for my, my scenario, I need to figure those stuff out. Uh, but I, I, beside that, like, uh, uh, that's, that's my goal. I want to, I want to, I just, I, I'm very busy already, like think about like to open my gym over here. You know? that, that, that's a lot for 2024. 20, you know? That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, it's obviously going to be a perfect location for like vacation seminars. And uh, I mean, man, you're in Hawaii. Where, where, where else would you rather be you know, to, 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 for a vacation, jujitsu vacation? That would be amazing. So uh, really- It's hard to beat. It's hard to beat. Very yeah. hard to beat. Yeah, yeah. So man, I'm, I'm really looking forward to watching that grow and, and seeing you prosper. And hopefully someday, I've never been to Hawaii, but now I have an even bigger reason to go so once you once you're set up i would love to come visit just like i visited the new york school i'd love to come to come see your new school out there in hawaii once it's operational everybody everybody deserves to be in hawaii everybody deserves to come here and visit come at least once right absolutely oh, i would love to i would love to well folks unfortunately we're fresh out of time marcelo i appreciate you being so generous with your time today it's always just such an honor to get to talk with you uh i'm so happy for for obviously the outcome of your fight against cancer i think the whole community is just you know celebrating together that, that, that that's something that you overcame i know that was very scary and it was really cool to see everybody pull together i know bernardo hosted seminars to help and and, and other schools did the same so Everyone's very happy about the results of that. And also very exciting to see that you have a new school coming to Hawaii very soon. Obviously, you're welcome back on the show anytime you want to come back and chat with me. You're welcome anytime. Thank you so much, Raya. You, um, it was a tough moment, but you don't believe. You know I mean, I, I, felt, I felt so much love. You know I mean, people, people like uh, uh, really took care of me. You know I mean? and, and I cannot be more thankful. You know what I mean? Even people that I didn't know before, they reach out to, to give like a... Uh, uh, very good words that makes me feel good about you know what I mean. So I I just cannot be more thankful. You know? It was it was a tough moment, but showed me a lot. You know what I mean. So I'm just I'm just very grateful. You know? That's outstanding. And uh, and for anyone out there that wants to keep up with Marcelo, it's really easy to do so. He's active on Instagram. Uh, it's Marcelo Garcia Jiu Jitsu on Instagram. His Facebook is, uh, he has a Facebook athlete page. So it's just Marcelo Garcia. You'll find the athlete page. Make sure you follow him there. Um, and then uh, his website is MarceloGarciaJJ.com. That's going to have yes. all of his information about his school, his online academy, uh, seminars, all, anything that has to do with Marcelo. Is, you'll find it at MarceloGarciaJJ.com. Uh, guys, if you're ever in New York City, uh, again, it's one of my favorite schools I ever got to visit during my time doing jiu-jitsu. It's right there in Manhattan. You'll have a great time. Drop into Marcelo Garcia Jiu-Jitsu in New York City. Hopefully very soon, uh, Marcelo's Academy in Hawaii will be open, so make sure you guys are paying attention to the website and his social media to find out about that. And if you can't make it to New York or Hawaii, you can learn from uh, from Marcelo anywhere in the world here at BJJFanatics.com. The instructional we talked about in depth today was his bestseller, The Complete Butterfly Guard. Uh, but again, he's got several different instructionals with us. So whatever aspect of your game you're trying to improve, uh, make sure that you uh, head over to BJJFanatics.com, type in Marcelo Garcia. And you won't be disappointed with any of the uh, options that are there. And that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast. <laughs>